appreciate and enjoy the proceedings and contribute fully. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks.
Testing. <laughs> Testing. Is it working? Is it working? Oh. Testing, <laughs> testing, testing, testing. It's working? Yeah. Yes. Th thank you all uh, for coming and a pleasant good morning to all of you. My name is Anthony Peter Gonzalez. I am the interim director of the Institute of International Relations. Um, I stress interim, and um, I should mention that yesterday I did that to a group, and one of my colleagues reminded me that Einstein said that everything is interim. The only thing that is permanent is, is human stupidity. So <laughs> I took some comfort in that. <laughs> so, well, my task this morning is a very simple one. I just want to introduce the members of the head table and some of the prominent people here. Um, we're still awaiting the representative of the Attorney General. The Attorney General yesterday indicated that he could not come and um, he had a cabinet, an emergency cabinet meeting this morning. So he's sending his senior counsel, uh, Samraj Hari Paul, who's the chairman of the Law Reform uh, Committee, 
who should have been here, but he'll probably join us uh, shortly. Um, but we'll go ahead and we hope that by the time we reach his slot, um, he would be here. We have as well the Commissioner, uh, 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 Commissioner Tracy uh, Robinson, whom I, I think you all know very well. She is the first Vice President of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, and she also heads this um, delegation from the, from the Commission. We have our dear uh, principal, Professor Clem Sankat, who is head of the UWI St. Augustine campus. Among us, we do have a number of other prominent people. I don't think I have the names of all of them, so forgive me if I don't mention some of you. I, I do recognize Sir Dennis Bra uh, Byron, who is um, a good friend of the Institute and who has come to a number of events that we have had here. He's president of the Caribbean Court of Justice. We have other distinguished commissioners, as you would see on the program. We have uh, other distinguished attorneys who are, who are well known um, in the region. We have uh, some of our uh, distinguished lecturers, as well as distinguished representatives from the diplomatic corps. So let me say how pleased I am to, to, to see you all here, here today. To begin, I now want to call on our principal to say a few welcoming uh, uh, words and to greet you to this uh, seminar. Principal Clement Sanka. Thank you very much, Director of the Institute of International Relations, uh, Dr. Gonzalez. Commissioners on the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, let me recognize Commissioner Tracy Robinson, Professor Rosemary Bellantwine and Professor Dina Shelton, OAS Representative Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Riyad Insanali. Welcome, Riyad. President of the Caribbean Court of Justice, Sir Dennis Byron. Members of the legal community, and I know there are several of you here, Colleagues of the UWI St. Augustine campus, especially those from the Institute of International Relations and the Faculty of Social Sciences, and of course from our new Faculty of Law. And let me recognize the Dean of the Faculty of Law, Dr. Kusha Harak Singh. Specially invited guests, members of the media, good morning to all of you. And I see our representative, yes, I see our, welcome. welcome. And let us also welcome, Oops, sorry, thank you, senior counsel and Chairman of the Law Reform Committee, Mr. Samraj Haripal, who is also, as you, you heard, representing the Attorney General. It's really a pleasure for me to welcome all of you to the St. Augustine campus of the University of West Indies and the Institute of International Relations in particular for this seminar on Inter-American Human Rights System. The opportunity that this seminar presents for discussion, debate, and discourse on building, strengthening, and bettering the issues associated with human rights is without doubt an excellent and very significant initiative. Let me, before I go on, say a special word to, of welcome to Mr. Harry Paul, representing the AG this morning. Mr. Harry Paul, your presence here this morning is testimony to the importance and relevance of this seminar and certainly the support of the government of Trinidad and Tobago and the office of the Attorney General is sincerely acknowledged. I would also like to extend a special welcome to the President of the Caribbean Court of Justice Sir Dennis Byron, and all the members of the Inter-American Commission who have taken time from what we know are their very busy schedules and 
taking time to travel to be here with us at St. Augustine. We at the UWI St. Augustine campus do look forward to further strengthening our collaboration with all of you as we work together to advance national and regional development. Distinguished guests, the matter of human rights is very important to all of us. In fact, it is a global issue. We live in a world where millions of people are denied their basic rights to education, to health care, to housing, to jobs, to freedom, and yes, to democracy. This is troubling, particularly as it persists as countries become more enlightened, more developed, and what is more worrying, where there is so much more communication within the world. We are certainly much more con connected than we were ever before. And yet, some of these challenges continue to exist. This is why we must make it our duty to speak on these issues, to think on these issues, and to act on these issues. Violations of human rights not only impede and threaten the social and communal aspects of our country and region, but it also affects the political aspects, such as our democracy and governance, and our individual rights as human beings. It affects our freedom and our liberty. For this reason, the strengthening of human rights must be of great concern to all of us at every level, individual, community, national, regional, and hemispheric. As Martin Luther King Jr. once noted, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We must therefore be very vigilant. We must see it as our collective social responsibility to speak and act on these issues wherever they may be occurring and work in a manner that would uplift our people especially in the communities of throughout the Americas. As I reflected on, on this uh, meeting here this morning, and I'm sure those of you who are the researchers in this area must have done the work that shows the linkage between poverty and the suppression of human rights. Without doing the research, let me see the images around the world point to that. That where people's rights are challenged, people's rights are suppressed, where persons are not given an opportunity to be educated so that they can think, they can think critically and creatively, they remain in a state of poverty. In this context, I would like to congratulate the Acting Director of the Institute of International Relations, Dr. Anthony Gonzalez, for collaborating with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights on this critically important seminar. I am advised that there is a series of similar seminars taking place throughout the sub-regions of the Americas, and this one at the IIR is representative of the work in our part of the Caribbean and while Dr. Gonzalez said he's interim director, let me say how pleased I am as campus principal with the work that he has been doing at this institute to keep us connected with our stakeholders, to keep us connected with the world, and to keep us connected with the issues of the day. Thank you very much, Dr. Gonzalez, for what you've been doing. It is truly an honor to see your campus partnering with internationally renowned institutions actively working to promote respect for human rights as set forth in the Declaration of the Rights and Duties of Man. I also find, find it appropriate to congratulate the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights for their significant contribution to promoting human rights throughout the Western Hemisphere. <coughs> Through the work of this organization, people from Latin America and the Caribbean 
are far more aware of their entitlement to basic rights, as well as a level of transparency and accountability expected from their leaders. Our people are definitely more conscious of ways to seek legal redress from the Commission. This is clearly evident from the numbers of petitions sent to the Commission concerning, for example, women's right, rights, freedom of expression, the rights of indigenous people, environmental rights, etc. In fact, I'm advised that one of the first cases of domestic violence that went to the Commission came right here in, from Trinidad and Tobago. So to members of the Commission, congratulations. You are indeed a dedicated and committed organization making a real impact on improving the lives of our people in the region, and I do salute you for your work. As I close, let me reiterate my pleasure to welcome you to our campus and to this seminar. I truly believe that the rich diversity of knowledge and experience that exists among the academics and professionals participating in this seminar will facilitate cross-fertilization of ideas, which will help us to contribute significantly to strengthening the inter-American human rights system. And I am very, very pleased to see my colleagues from the Faculty of Law, and let me say, the Faculty of Law at St. Augustine, because we now have a Faculty of Law here, starting the beginning of this academic year. I'm very pleased to see my colleagues from this faculty partnering and engaging. And my hope is that they will become a leading light for our campus and our country on matters on issues pertaining to these. And of course, many matters that are swirling around us as I speak. That our faculty of law will help to become the thought leaders for our campus, our university, and our, country, and, our, and our country and region. With those words, I encourage all participants to draw on the information shared in this seminar and in your respective contexts to act on the basis of conviction, morality, and a genuine commitment for the protection of human rights, and for me, particularly to uplift the poor people in our region. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you, and I wish all of you a productive and meaningful seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Principal. I now would like to ask Commissioner Tracy Robinson to say a few words of greeting. Commissioner Robinson. Thank you very much, Chair, Dr. Gonzales, representative of the Attorney General, Mr. Samraj Harry Paul, the President of the Caribbean Court of Justice and Judges of the Court, Judge Margaret McCauley of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal, Professor Clem Sankat, representative of the OAS, in Trinidad, Tobago, Mr. Riyadh in Sinali, and representatives of the OAS member states who are present today. Uh, my colleagues at the University of the West Indies, my old classmates, students of the various faculties, human rights defenders present, um, a warm word of welcome to you all from the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. And on behalf of its president and all of its members, today I'm joined by Commissioner Dinah Shelton, who is a professor of law, international law at George Washington University School of Law, and the former president of the commission, and the rapporteur for all of the CARICOM countries on the commission, except for Haiti. I'm also joined by Professor Rosemary Antoine, uh, who is well known to you in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, also a commissioner, as well as the new executive secretary, of the Commission, Mr. Emilio Alvarez Icasa, and I welcome him to the Caribbean and to Trinidad and Tobago as well, and Hilaire Sobas, who is a staff attorney and human rights specialist at the Commission, who has been responsible for assisting in organizing. From the Inter-American Court on Human Rights, we're also pleased to have 
uh, Judge Margaret May McCauley from Jamaica joining us as well. Today is the fifth in a series of regional fora that have been held just over the last month that are devoted to the question of strengthening the inter-American human rights system. Uh, earlier this year, the Commission decided to undertake an in-depth study of its own procedures and mechanisms and to have consultations with the actors that use the system and also that we would like to see using the system more. Four have been held in Colombia, in Costa Rica, Chile, and a large meeting took place last week in Mexico that enjoyed the participation of 21 member states of the OAS, including Suriname, Haiti, and Jamaica, members of the, Car the CARICOM community, as well as many civil society organizations. The Commission wishes to express its deep appreciation to the Institute of International Relations and the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine, for hosting this event. The President of Colombia, a country that faces grave human rights challenges, opened the first forum in Bogota on the 22nd of August this year. And at that time, he declared his commitment to the work of the Inter-American Human Rights System and he described the system as one of the most significant legal achievements of the 20th century. Though this is a little known history for those of us in the Caribbean, he was alluding to the very fundamental role played by the commission and the system in general in dealing with serious human rights abuses uh, during military regimes and dictatorships and authoritarian governments in Latin America and on a range of key issues, including the rights of women and indigenous persons. Though there are differences in our 20th century histories, we would do well in the Caribbean to resist and reject notions of Caribbean exceptionalism in relation to human rights. The 21st century human rights challenges facing democracies in the Americas, including those in the Caribbean, and the ones that the inter-American human rights system has been seeking to address, especially over the last decade, bear remarkable similarities. Violence against women and children and impunity for those crimes. Citizens, citizen insecurity in the context of high levels of crime. Access to justice for the most vulnerable. The absence of effective protection for the rights of LGBTI persons. Issues relating to migrants who are primarily moving from up north and often been sent back south. The vulnerability of human rights defenders, amongst others. It's precisely because the relationship between the English-speaking Caribbean and the inter-American human rights system has been less well-developed that this formal moment of strengthening and consultation presents a real opportunity for the Caribbean, where only four of 12 English-speaking Caribbean countries are parties to the principal human rights convention. The, the American Convention on Human Rights, Barbados, Dominica, Grenada, and Jamaica. And of those four, only Barbados has accepted the compulsory jurisdiction of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. As you'll discover, the Commission still hears petitions and monitors the human rights situation in member states that are not parties to the Convention. But ratification sends a positive message to citizens about the state's commitment to human rights and its full participation in a system that over its lifetime has received and responded to over 20,000 petitions. And uh, would allow if Caribbean states so choose also access for its citizens to the Inter-American Court. Last year alone, the Commission received over 1,600 new petitions, carried out over 91 hearings, 58 working meetings, over 30 working and promotion visits led by commissioners in the Americas and co conducted seminars and training courses as well. Even with severe resource constraints, the commission has effected reforms at all stages of the processing of cases that have improved efficiency and the handling of urgent cases such as death penalty ones, which have been a concern for users of the system in the Caribbean. Today's seminar and the visit of the Commission to Trinidad and Tobago provide another opportunity for the Commission to continue its dialogue with the Caribbean states about how it can strengthen relations and their participation in the inter-American human rights system. 
And the Commission thanks the Attorney General and Mr. Samaraj Harry Paul for the remarks which will be delivered today. Today is also an opportunity to further the discussion about how the Commission can address the needs of those facing the greatest vulnerability and threats to the meaningful exercise of their human rights and how the Commission can facilitate uh, greater access for victims to its processes. Thank you very much for coming. We look forward to the discussions we'll have for the rest of the morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner uh, Robinson, for those uh, words of, um, of greeting. I fully endorse uh, your recognition of certain specific members of the Commission, which I probably didn't, didn't do in my, in my introduction. It's my pleasure now to invite uh, Senior Counsel, Samraj Haripal, who is Chairman of the Legal Reform Committee, to say a few words uh, with respect to opening this conference. <laughs> Senior Counsel. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just one correction, I'm the Chairman of the Law Reform Commission. In light of what has been said last night, the Legislative Review Committee is a very different body, very different body. Good morning. Um, first, I'd like to apologize for the absence of the Honorable Attorney General Alan Ram Logan. In light of the developments from yesterday to today, um, he's been called to a different level of political duty. I must say that he had confirmed that he would have attended, and he was quite happy to have been invited by the principal to do these opening remarks, but he does sincerely apologize because of other pressing higher political commitments at the moment. If I may, can I adopt the protocols of my colleagues at the head table and perhaps then read for you the statement that had actually been prepared for the Attorney General in relation to him making these opening remarks on behalf of the government of Trent Tobago. So, I'll go verbatim. It is my pleasure and privilege to have been invited here today to give this opening remark at this seminar, which is designed critically to examine mechanisms to promote and strengthen our inter-American inter human rights system. In 1948, the OAS found its genesis in a pledge by its members to fight communism in the Western Hemisphere. This development is one in a long line of events which sought to define and protect fundamental human rights throughout human history. This international organization has built its very existence in meetings like this very one that we are here today, where system analysis by relevant stakeholders is conducted in an effort to grow and improve our protection of human rights. The commission established in 1959 by the U.S. is given that mandate to protect and promote human rights throughout the region. Within the American Declaration of Human Rights and the Duties of Man, which was adopted at the same time of the charter of the, U of the U.S. in 1948, it is stated, and I quote, judicial and political institutions have as their principal and aim the protection of the essential rights of man, unquote. It is laudable, therefore, that the Commission has declared that with the whole truth to this basic principle when examining proposals regarding any amendment to its rules, policies, and practices. The Commission plays a very crucial role in the current review process in relation to the implementation, protection, and promotion of human rights throughout the region. The Commission, therefore, is without a doubt one, if not the most critical cog in the wheels which make up the Inter-American Human Rights Protection System. The Commission, therefore, is a monitor on the human rights violation in relation to all the member states of the U.S., receiving individual complaints and petition, and doing considerable work throughout its thematic repetition in order to fulfill its sizable mandate. Therefore, it is incredibly astute that this organization has chosen to start with the proverbial man in the mirror when it comes to strengthening the overall human rights system. 
I look with high favor upon the very methodology adopted today, whereby the actual users of the system of human rights protection would get an opportunity once more to interact with each other for the sole purpose of improving an already admirable mechanism. This, ladies and gentlemen, is what human rights protection is about. It goes beyond the bureaucracies and politics of international and local organizations. Even beyond what each member state may need or wants, but really the crux of core value of an exercise like this one before us today is that the entities which use a system gets an opportunity to have their say in how that system is operating and may be improved. I also wish to express my continued admiration and respect for the Institute of International Relations at the University of the West Indies and Augustine campus for the role it continues to play in promoting a better understanding of Caribbean international relations. This institution is known for its numerous collaboration with multilateral agencies, diplomatic missions, the media, and NGOs. The hosting of today's seminar at this institution bears crucial witness to this fact. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my hope and high expectation that today would prove to be fruitful and seeing us moving towards a system in which the protection of human rights would be given priority in all member states. The protection of human rights has and always been very close to my heart. In fact, it was the most significant pillar of my private legal practice. The efforts of the Commission and the Institute today in facilitating discussions on the process of strengthening the inter-American human rights system and in, and in indict, indi and in identifying related issues as they affect the Caribbean is indeed laudable. It brings us all, it brings us all one step closer to achieving the goal of promoting and protecting human rights in the American hemisphere and in consolidating a system of individual liberty and social justice based on the respect for the essential rights of man within the framework of democratic institutions as contemplated by the OAS Charter. I want to reiterate that the government of Trent Tobago is committed to the protection of human rights within our legal and constitutional framework and the framework of the OAS. Again, I wish to express my appreciation for being invited to provide these opening remarks at this important ceremony. The discussion carded to take place today at the enhancement of our human rights systems are very much needed. And it is therefore with pleasure that I welcome all the participants here today, and I wish you success in this endeavor. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Senior Counsel. We have certainly noted your, your emphasis on the protection of human rights and your, your desire to see the Commission strengthen itself in its, in its work ahead. We have now come to the end of the opening session. I want to thank um, all the presenters for introducing this, um, this subject. We will take a short break as we move into the first session. So I would just like to invite um, Dr. Michelle Scobie and uh, Professor Rosemary Bellantwine for, uh, for the next session as we, as we turn over. So thank you all again for, for, for coming, and I do hope that you stay the course with us until I believe we're going until about 1 o'clock. So thanks again.
Well, good morning again, everyone, and welcome to the Institute of International Relations. I'm Michelle Scobie, um, lecturer in international law, global environmental governance, and international economic law here at the Institute. And of course, it's with great pleasure that we are able to host uh, this um, forum on strengthening the inter-American human rights system. It is my pleasure to introduce to you someone who I don't believe needs any introduction, so I don't know why I'm here, but anyway. Um, and that is Professor Rosemarie Bell Antoine. She is Commissioner of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Uh, she has dual citizenship. She is both Trini and Lucian, or from Trinidad and Tobago and St. Lucia. She was elected at the 41st OAS General Assembly in June 2011 for the four-year term, which began on January the 1st, 2012. Commissioner Antoine is an attorney at law. She's also chair, uh, uh, professor of law at the University of the West Indies, Barbados. She specializes in human rights, financial law, comparative law, administrative law, public service law, discrimination law, as well as labor law. Professor Antoine is a Oxford Commonwealth scholar, a Cambridge Pegasus scholar. She has her doctorate from the University of Oxford and uh, an LLM from Cambridge. And her LLB is from our alma mater, the University of the West Indies, uh, St. Augustine. <laughs> She also holds diplomas and certificates uh, with distinction in international human rights from the International Institute of Human Rights in Strasbourg, France. She is a Cambridge Fellow. She's a consulting partner in the firm of Antoine, Anthony and Antoine. Commissioner Antoine's interest in human rights uh, extends uh, to economic, social, and cultural rights. Uh, and the ways in which these uh, inform more concretely protected civil and political rights. Her work in disciplines such as law, financial law, health law, and trade has enhanced the approach that she's been able to adopt and complement uh, her human rights interests. As a labor law scholar, she embraces the philosophy of uh, Nobel laureate Sen in the active proclamation, promulgation, sorry, of human rights, uh, and uh, noting that that does not diminish uh, environmental, uh, sorry, economic growth, no development. Commissioner Antoine is also the founding member of the Barbados Coalition Against Sexual Harassment, and has parted, participated actively in foundational activities of CAFRA, one of the most uh, important organizations in this region dedicated to gender equality. Oh, she has uh, been a lead consultant, perhaps to all of the governments of the region, of the Commonwealth Caribbean, as well as uh, to governments outside the region, uh, the United Kingdom, Venezuela, USA, Canada, etc. I will stop here because she has to speak. I can continue for another maybe 10 minutes on, on, on the introductions to Commissioner Antoine. But just to let me say once again how happy we are to have her with us this morning. And she will be speaking on the issue of the inter-American human rights system and the Caribbean, more particularly its relevance and challenges for the Caribbean. I give you Professor and Commissioner Antoine. Good morning, everyone. Just to make one correction, to the, I'm not the founding member of CASH, uh, one of the founding members, along with Tracy Robinson, who's with the commissioner here today. Uh, I'm really happy to be here, and I'm especially happy to be with my colleagues from the judiciary, the CCJ, uh, other members of the fraternity, legal fraternity, and academic community, and of course, NGOs and students, and I want to recognize our new dean as well. We've had all the protocol arrangements, but um, said, oh, and I have to say that um, our deputy principal, Rhoda Reddick, has now joined us, so uh, thank you for gracing us with your presence. My task this morning is to lay the groundwork for the rest of the discussion in the seminar, 
and I'm going to give you a little bit of background, but basically just to throw out a few ideas, some sort of broad conceptual ideas that hopefully will have resonance as we go along in the <coughs> seminar. So to start the dialogue, in other words, so they've thrown me to the world so that we can open up the discussion. And basically, we are gathered here today because it is said that the Inter-American System on Human Rights, and in particular the Commission, is in crisis. And some would argue that this is really an artificial crisis manufactured by a handful of states, and I'm not going to bother to name those states, uh, and that the work of the court, the work of the Commission will continue. But nevertheless, it is a crisis all the same, a crisis of confidence, and a crisis of legitimacy. So for me, there's a certain poeticism, symbolism, in that we are actually having this discussion here in Trinidad and Tobago. There's some sort of symbolic value, I think, to it, because although it was purely accidental, and that is because Trinidad and Tobago, unfortunately, was the first country to denounce the convention in 1999. And I said this was not planned. But I think it's, there's no better place really for us to consider how to strengthen and perhaps how to resuscitate the commission and the system than to be here in the heart of the jungle. And I fully expect at the end of the day that we can emerge with a treaty of St. Augustine. <laughs> <laughs> But nevertheless, uh, it is true that there has been a troubled relationship between the Commission and some countries. On the one hand, we have a thinly veiled hostility towards the system and the Commission. And of course, this has given impetus to this particular exercise. And on the other, and perhaps a much more dangerous, certainly insidious attitude toward the commission and the system than hostility, however negative hostility might be, is apathy. And that's what I think we see in this region. The kind of apathy that's born first out of a lack of understanding and knowledge, but more importantly, I think a sense of alienation. And so I believe that this Apathy is directed not only at the system, this particular inter-American system in itself, but also more destructively at international human rights in general, <clears throat> and even human rights itself. Sometimes I think that human rights is now a bad word. And this, I think, this apathy, this sense of alienation, more than anything has the potential to destroy the system. So those states which are hostile at the moment because of some decision that the commission or the court may have made, at least they are fully engaged. And more importantly, their voices are being heard. So even if there's less direct participation in the future, so for example, Venezuela has just announced, they've noticed that they are going to be denouncing the convention, just did that this month, was it? They already have a body uh, of rights jurisprudence that has been built up over the years through the involvement with the commission and the court. And I don't think that that jurisprudence can be easily erased. So I believe it will continue to permeate their own domestic borders. So they're okay. I think they're a little better off than us here in the region. In contrast, here in the Caribbean, in Trinidad and Tobago and the rest of the Caribbean, <clears throat> the work of the commission is little known and little understood. And the average citizen does not feel that it plays in any part, any special part in their own daily lives. And although there's been some progress, it has been very slow. And I think in the main limited to very specialist actors. So some of the NGOs, wonderful NGOs that we have here today, for instance, and a handful of academics. So I think in order for us to begin strengthening or thinking about strengthening the system, we have to be able to counter, to find ways to counter this ever-increasing apathy. 
And it's important to note that the work of the commission, the work of the court, doesn't only revolve around hearing petitions. Our jurisdiction, as seven independent, and I stress independent, commissioners, who are human rights specialists, in our own rights, yes, we hear petitions, we determine whether they are admissible according to set criteria. So for example, domestic remedies have to be exhausted and so on. Uh, we determine whether on the merits of the case they should proceed to the Inter-American Court if the particular country has accepted the compulsory jurisdiction of the court. But we also have other important rules, such as the ever increasing important uh, precautionary measures, which we have jurisdiction to do, a type of injunction to guard against continued violations of human rights where they threaten life or present immediate harm. And just as importantly is our role in the promotion of human rights, and that in particular is something that is not well known, human rights education, promotion of human rights. And perhaps it is that which will do most to alleviate the kind of apathy that I was talking about. So therefore, this relationship, or perhaps lack of a relationship, with the American inter-American system and the region remains difficult. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice, I'm getting over from the flu. And so the exodus from the convention in 1999 by Trinidad, as we all know, was a direct result of a death penalty issue, a subject that has caused considerable angst in the region, thank you, it is unfortunate, I think, that the, the commission, the court, and international human rights in general have become synonymous with trying to prevent hanging people. Yeah, that's what people think about. And I have to confess that I myself as a scholar in the beginnings of this discussion written in, in that vein. So I had a hand in that. Uh, I think one of our main tasks, however, is to demonstrate that the commission and its work is much broader than simply the death penalty issue. That's something we need to really discuss and hopefully today we can talk a bit more about it. And of course I recognize the fear about the infringement of sovereignty. So there's this argument about a sovereign government. Who are these select few people who sit there in Washington or in Costa Rica and make these pronouncements? They're not elected by the people, no, we are not. How dare they tell us what to do? Who do we represent? There's a certain suspicion, I think, that comes with this wall of sovereignty. And we have to do something to allay these fears. So we've managed to steamroll the system with the death penalty issue. I once wrote an, a, a short piece called Opting Out of the Optional Protocol. Is this humane? Because I think just the actually leaving it presents some other issues. But my, I think also part of the problem, if we are to be realistic and honest in our discussion, is this sense that it seems to be a directive from above, human rights, somebody telling us what to do. And it's not so much that we ourselves could not reach some of these conclusions or deliberate ourselves and come up with some of these answers, but there's a certain resentment that it's someone telling us what to do next, and I'm not convinced that in every case, the issue has to do with the legal principle as opposed to esp who espouses the principle. And we saw that very clearly in the death penalty, the Pratt and Morgan, even apart from the commission and, and the court, the Privy Council, our reaction to the Privy Council and so on. And more recently, we are seeing it with the instruction or it, some people thought it was a, a sort of um, a threat from the UK, that if you don't abolish sodomy laws, this is going to happen, so abolish it or else. I'm not so sure that discussion had as much traction in Trinidad, but it had a lot of traction in Barbados and the talk shows. How dare they tell us what to do, kind of thing. So is it the message or is it the messenger? And in my view, and perhaps it's a naive view, there's less opposition, I think, it, to talking at least about changing uh, our norms and so on than we think. But 
there's no real space to have the dialogue. We have not created the spaces for the dialogue. And I think that's one of the greatest strengths of us, an inter-American system, that it can help to create those spaces. And so I think that we are invited to participate, to help define a more broad-based kind of human rights, a more broad-based type of morality. Nonetheless, in many instances, the only voice is through the international system, or that is what seems, seems to be for the marginalized, for instance. And these issues need to be interrogated. If not, um, the system remains insular. <clears throat> so without the commission and without international bodies, I'm not convinced that this dialogue would happen. And I can give you some examples. Right now we have over 14 petitions from the hard work persons like Kelly and so on gave me this data. But there are many, in all cases in Trinidad and Tobago, there are death penalty cases, all of the ones before the commission. But there are other kinds of matters elsewhere. Issues of indigenous rights from Belize and Suriname, issues of life, and incidentally, that is grounded almost solely in international law, indigenous rights. Issues of life and citizenship, children's rights in Haiti and Guyana, and at least one case, to my surprise, on the right to associate with a union in Antigua. And the commission also has begun to issue provisional measures in the region, notably last year for the benefit of one Maurice Tomlinson, a former student of ours, now our colleague, uh, against homophobic perse persecution. And we expect in the near future to hear cases on HIV, sodomy, gender, etc. In terms of our press releases, recently we issued press releases about the shooting of protesters in Linden, Guyana, quite controversial police killings in Jamaica, about the continued dire situation in Haiti. We also presented a report on the rights of Afro-descendants, which had some findings which were surprising to some, such as the greater difficulties faced by Afro-descendants in, in being able to access capital, even in countries with black majorities, and perhaps not so surprising, continuing obstacles faced in a system administering justice, or confronting judicial and administrative institutions. And of course, we th think about the Trayvon Martin, USA being part of our OES, an inter-American system. And of course, across borders, such as the issue of migrants. And I would ask, would these voices and these concerns have been heard without a commission? In each of these situations, or let's say, that, to be fair, the majority of these situations, there were little or no state responses and almost no regional responses. And I'm thinking particularly of the Linden. Um, I didn't see this reported. It was not reported widely. The, the, and we're not talking about blaming a government at this point. We're simply talking about reporting an issue of alleged human rights violations. And there might have been over the fence gossip. I don't even think we had that. Uh, where was the region's sense of outrage? in these matters. So does the domestic legal system have the capacity to harness and address these matters? And although it is true that at the moment the system is being underutilized in this particular region and known primarily by just a few, these examples I think give a, demonstrate very clearly the tremendous potential of the inter-American system. But there's no doubt, of course, that these are hard questions. I'm not attempting to trivialize the breadth of the task. It's a mammoth task. No, I think the depth of the fundamental tensions that arise in relation to active engagement with these issues and, and with an international human rights monitoring system. Obviously, these are normative issues. They're deep and difficult. They are hard, what we call hard questions in law. And what we are confronting are really evolving social norms. And in a sense, I think the, the Commonwealth Caribbean sort of remains a sort of Judeo-Christian type of values that we have still in the region, whereas much of the 
so-called developed world have abandoned or abandoning some of these. And their, their voices tend to be, I suppose, distilled more clearly in international human rights systems. So it's inevitable that we are going to have tensions. And I think it's perhaps something of a paradox that while we are still centered on these very traditionalist values, we are at the same time some of the most open societies in the world. So these are more than simply legal questions, formal legal questions. They have a jurisprudential base. They're grounded in the vision of ourselves as social beings. And I think one of the questions that we have to ask, Ruthie, that I'm interested in, is whether, given the conflicting is views on some of these issues, in what are essentially pluralistic societies like we have, one of the questions we can ask is whether we should even invite our laws or think about our laws and legal systems as being secular, separating them from some of these essentially moral or moralistic issues. And I wonder, I haven't heard it expressed this way, but I think in some sense, the underlying logic of the call to decriminalize sodomy, it, it can fall under that category. A hands-off approach, let's keep it separate. Why bring the law into it if we can't? So uh, very, as I said, difficult questions to contemplate, but nevertheless, they have to be asked. Uh, it is true that international human rights norms can develop outside of the remit of these international bodies through domestic courts. Domestic courts have a role in identifying these norms, and we begin to see some evidence of it in our courts. And I want to pay homage to our distinguished judges and the CCJ in the Boyce case, for instance and their uh, acknowledgement of international human rights norms. But we've also seen it in labor law. Of course, as you know, that's my other hat. So um, Douglas Mendes, who's here, would know about the Republic Bank, if I'm correct, he was part of it, the case with, um, yes, on reviewing sexual harassment, and the courts looked at the ILO Convention, international human rights norms, and said, although we had no law in Trinidad, still don't. Oh no, now we probably do with the um, equality now being passed. I guess you can say we do. But at that time, no hard legislation, and the court said, well, international human rights, ILO convention, sexual harassment can't be something that we can accept in our industrial relations environment. But it is the case that the judicial system and the judiciary remain limited because they cannot treat directly with international law because it's not directly enforceable in our law. And certainly they don't make law or cannot make law. I see Justice Saunders smiling. He's talked to my class about that. Do judges make law? <laughs> one of these, for the non-lawyers, that's one of the questions which are very controversial. So we have to find better and more indirect ways to introduce these new right, rights norms or, or systems. I think the withdrawal of Trinidad and Tobago was a knee-jerk reaction. And it, at the time, it was a very little known entity, the international human rights system. And uh, it is somewhat ironic that with that withdrawal, it perhaps gave more mileage to these bodies. At least it made it more visible. So that while governments were withdrawing literally and figuratively, uh, there were the select few were waking up to the possibilities. So, but I worry though, and this is particularly in relation to the NGOs, I worry that this system or the way we approach a system should not simply become a sort of alternative system, a kind of sidekick. And I think there's a responsibility on the users of the system, in particular the NGOs, to ensure that the dialogue is not, I call it bipolar, that it happens first and foremost in the community, in the society. So it's not simply in the national sphere, in other words. So to attempt to bring the society along with the issues, and not, re not only to rely on the international sphere, some sort of idealized, sanitized environment. It's relatively easy to run to the commission and get what you consider to be the right answer. But I think that answer has to have so form some part of the social, of social consensus. It doesn't mean that we have to wait 
until there is consensus, I'm not suggesting that and I don't accept that. But I'm simply saying that sometimes I think we sort of disengage from the particular societies. Oh, now I'm going to understand. Let's go to the International Human Rights Court and the Commission and, and then have a piece of paper. Oh, we did. But the danger is that the remedies which we probably will get will be rejected by the society. They'll see, be seen to be out of sync. So I think we need to do the hard work on the ground also. We need to engage with our own societies and that the issues must be taken to the people, whatever the issue is. And part of the difficulty, of course, is that we have outgrown our constitutions to a large extent. So that the result is that often the legal answer on the international plane is too far beyond the very limited constitutions that we have, or it requires very unrealistic stretching of our own constitutions. And of course, we deem and should deem our constitution sacred. So it must be an imperative for our constitutions to be revisited in open and enlightened ways. There must be genuine discussion of human rights, not just to change one line about politics or governments, but also about human rights and the content of human rights uh, so that international norms and, 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 and values can gain traction in that discussion. And I don't think this has really been done genuinely in the region. So I don't believe it's not a case that we're not ready for new values. I think it's more of a case that we haven't done the groundwork to make ourselves ready because it's an evolutionary process. And it's very interesting to me that we always assume that international human rights norms will be more enlightened, that they'll be more liberal, they'll be more objective, they'll be more fair. But there's, I can add a note of caution because I see, for example, trends in North America and Europe which I believe will be translated sooner or later to those international systems of um, a, a lack of tolerance on the basis of religion, especially Islam. And we all know why that is so. We don't need to go into that. And if you look, as I do, at those cases on employment and discrimination, you see it very, very clearly, a different curve altogether. We were very accommodating, the principle of accommodation, now it's gone the other way. And our courts all over the world in Europe are so upholding these sort of very restrictive cases. Not at all an enlightened approach. Of course, we know it's with hysteria and all of that. Whereas I can contrast that with the Trinidad and Tobago, which despite its problems is still genuinely a multicultural and certainly a multi-religious country. I remember the case of Mohammed and Moraine. You all know that case. It wasn't the best constitutional law case, but we got the right answer because there was a sense of public outrage that this young child who is Muslim would not be allowed to wear her hijab in convent. Ordinary people, I see people nodding, were saying, oh, she should be a, why not? Because we are a tolerant society, more than we think, ordinary people. And so I think the judiciary came to the right decision. I think also the Trinity Cross case. Was it Mahap Manam Sam? I can never get the name right. Sat, yes, it's Sat Maraj, but he has a long name, Mahan Saba, right? Where they challenge the courts to change um, what used to be the highest award called the Trinity Cross. We no longer call it the Trinity Cross. Yes? Because it, that was a Catholic Christian concept. I mean, that happened in Trinidad and Tobago. So my point here is not that Trinidad doesn't need human rights or anything like that. It really is that I think that we can continue to search for just solutions in our societies, in our region, but I think we can also influence the development of international rights norms. So I believe strongly that we have a voice in developing a human rights jurisprudence. And remember I talked about alienation when I started. It can only happen if we participate in the process. So I see human rights as a collection of norms after a kind of a bargaining process, and I think there must be some element of indigenization. Perhaps some of my colleagues may not agree with me on the commission, but it's what I genuinely believe, what I've always believed. And I think particularly in the Caribbean, we can have a say in carving all this legal identity. These human rights norms and values that can be shared with an international community creating rules of recognition, let's say. And that's another reason and a powerful rationale 
for Trinidad and others ratifying the convention and accepting the court and a deeper engagement with the system's procedures. And I'm also mindful that we don't just simply want to get rid of one set of inherited values, the British colonial, and just take on wholesale international principles. I think there's, you know, there's something about that that we have to be think about seriously. Let's be open about it. Conscious engagement in the process. Ultimately, I don't think any jurisdiction can, as one jurist put it, uh, stop the tide of international law, unquote. It's going to be here to stay. And as they say, if you can't beat them, join them. That's how I look at it. So that we have some homework here at the commission as well. We have to work towards a more inclusive rights-based system as opposed to alienating one. And um, ensure that our constitutional jurisprudence can fit more neatly in it. I, I used to talk about hijacking our constitutions, not to mean a rejection of those norms, but rather as an invitation of coming together to hammer out these solutions. It cannot be a monologue. It has to be a dialogue in terms of human rights. And so from a broader perspective, I think, and I've said so to my colleagues, we at the commission also have to find ways and means of reconciling what are sometimes competing legal philosophies. One of the difficulties we have with some of those countries that are upset with us uh, is to do with the emphasis placed on civil and political individualistic conceptions of rights as opposed to economic, social, and cultural rights. So some other countries prefer to, to think about that, and our system is geared towards the former. I think if we don't look at these things seriously, we run the risk not only of failing those we serve, but being self-destructive. So how do we weigh these? And I also happen to be on the commission, apart from Rapporteur for Afro-Descendants and Race, also, quote unquote, responsible, because we don't have a rapporteurship for economic, cultural, and social rights. So I've been sitting with this committee, very hardworking committee. I've done absolutely nothing. I've just been sitting, because I'm new, and they've done all the work. But they've actually managed to even get resolutions at the OAS. So we are moving towards a convention. So we may not, may not be far away from the day when these rights, are, we view them as enforceable and substantive. And I think that would be important, especially in how we report our chapter four reporting on rights. So this is something to look forward to. I want to close with a sense of um, optimism to say that maybe again I'm naive, but I am optimistic about the future of human rights and the development of human rights and our place in the international system. I'm old enough to know that in a relatively short space of time in my career, I've seen so many changing attitudes. Today, for instance, I can sit and listen to people who live with HIV and with others who don't, and nobody literally wants to run away before they would, oh, they don't want to be close. I mean, that has gone through the window. We've seen development. I can sit around the table with friends and colleagues who are openly homosexual, and although they still confront prejudice in their daily lives, they can feel a certain level of comfort in coming to the table and being part of the community and the discourse. I see tremendous development in the in indig indigenous peoples, for instance, what has happened. Just a few years ago, when I was at school, and maybe it wasn't a few years ago that I was in primary school, but nevertheless, <laughs> when I was in primary school, do you remember we used to talk about the Caribs and Arawaks and how they ate people and all of that stuff? I don't know if the Jamaicans, they had that same reality. But that's what we were taught. We've moved so far, I'm not that old, so it's, we've moved so far away from that understanding of the rights of indigenous peoples. And that is solely because of the work of international law and international human rights. So that I am optimistic and I see a great potential for the strengthening of the system. But I do believe that we have to go hand in hand. So these are a few of my thoughts. Hopefully we can have the discussion. I don't know if I'm supposed to sit, stand. I'm not too sure. I'm going to go back and sit. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor Antoine. Um, we do have some time for discussion. I imagine the organizers would want uh, um, us to open the floor now. 
for comments or questions. Uh, she's raised uh, a terrible number, a uh, huge number of um, issues that we could, uh, we could look at and address. I don't know if anyone wants to make a comment at this time. There, there are microphones uh, available. You can go to the mic if you wish. Please um, introduce yourself before you begin. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Wesley Gibbings. Um, yes, Wesley Gibbings, I'm a journalist. I head an organization called the Association of Caribbean Media Workers. And I'm also on the Council of the International Freedom of Expression Exchange. In some issue, on some issues, I share uh, Professor Antoine's um, optimism with respect to Caribbean societies and the manner in which we are sort of conflicted with respect to what are emerging as international norms in the area of human rights and what are some of our um, antecedents with respect to our views on different kinds of people and so on. But in the area in which I think that we need to um, express stronger concern is the area of free expression. I think it's perhaps the single most um, threatened right within the, the framework of the Americas. And in the Caribbean, it's one in which there is a, a startling lack of sensitivity with respect to the kinds of threats that we do face. Within the inter-American system, for example, a very serious assault has been launched on the rapporteurship uh, with respect to freedom, free expression. And my organization, I think, was the only Caribbean organization that has taken up that mantle um, with respect to making people more aware of the, the nature of the threat and the implications for us in the Caribbean. Um, I think that there are very dangerous trends. Professor Antoine referred to the fact that in some instances, the UK and the US and the developed world, they lead. But in some instances, they're leading us in a direction that's tending to be more restrictive and to set us back more. And I think that the area of freedom of expression is one such area. Uh, if you look at how the different approaches to um, freedom of the internet, um, the use of the internet and internet content that the developed countries are, assist, are, help, are tending to lead us away from the general direction of um, keeping the internet free. So I thought I'd just raise those, um, those kinds of issues. And I think that in the Caribbean, we have the added problem of the cultural antecedents, again, being conflicted between us boasting of being so open, and we have the calypso and the dance hall, or whatever it is. But at the same time, um, our instincts lead us more in the direction of censorship and suppression, as opposed to openness and, um, and freedom of expression. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Giving. Thank you. My name is Kusha Harak Singh. I just wanted to thank Professor Antoine for, as usual, very wise and broad-ranging <coughs> comments. There are three that I want to identify with, which I particularly agree. The first one has to do, and it might sound strange coming from me, but it's about legal fetishism. It's about the approach to human rights <coughs> that places emphasis on the absence of intentional coercion. It was actually a point made by Professor Sen um, when he spoke here on this campus about two years ago, where he talked about moving the emphasis from what one can do or cannot do to what one can be, and therefore talking about capabilities and opportunities. So this is an important new ingredient, I think, in our approach to human rights. The second one has to do with the plea for secularism, as Professor Antoine called it, especially in a place like Trinidad and Tobago. I do notice, however, when she was talking about the Constitution, she said we should regard it as sacred. So you see how difficult <laughs> that we should regard it as sacred. Yes. <laughs> so you see how difficult it is. I mean, if I can, I'm, I'm not sure if the distinguished um, president of the Caribbean Court of Justice will remember this, but I was at his inauguration when um, he was being presented to the audience, and he was introduced as somebody who was brought up on the Good Book. 
And I'm pretty sure he will interpret this in the widest possible way. But this was in kits. And it really demonstrates a, a, a problem about the Caribbean and how difficult it is for us to understand our pluralism. So that was the second point. I mean, in Trinidad and Tobago, we still have, or had until recently, official government forms that required somebody to write down their Christian name and their surname. We have a case of a man here who, after about 60 years, finally got his NIS because his first name was regarded as his last name. There are many people who only have one name. We probably still have judges, if they do pronounce the death penalty in Trinidad, say this ritualistic formula about, and may God have mercy on your soul, to people whose soul um, cannot or does not need mercy. So that's an important problem that leads us to the third one, which is the role of international norms. And I think here I really want to agree with Professor Antoine that in Trinidad and Tobago, especially now, we have the ability to contribute to the worldwide debate about the development of a plural society and international norms. And I am actually looking forward to, to how our own emerging faculty of law here will contribute to that, situated as it is in a place like Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning to the audience. My name is uh, Grace Ramirez. I'm coming from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs from Ecuador. Uh, I would like just to clarify a few things. You mentioned that some states might be hostile to the Commission. I hope my country is not uh, among those ones uh, in, in, your, in your eyes. Um, what I would like to clarify is that the whole process that uh, we are now uh, seeing here is uh, it came actually from Cochabamba. Uh, in June, the General Assembly of uh, all states gathered and we have passed a resolution uh, that approves uh, the report made by a special group who made all the recommendations uh, to the commission, not only to the commission, but to the states and uh, to the members uh, that are part of uh, the American State Association. So uh, there is a process going on now among the uh, permanent commission in uh, Washington. And uh, all the ambassadors already have agreed to, uh, how to say, a schedule. And uh, how do we are going to do this uh, report uh, and to fulfill all these recommendations. So it's not that the states are hostile, but uh, the only thing I would like to clarify is that there is a, a process among the states because the states have created the OAS and also the commission. That, that's my only clarification. Thank you. Good day, everyone. Uh, the name is Sheldon A. Mitchell. Um, I'm a student of law at the University of West Indies, St. Augustine campus. And I'm also the founder of an organization, an NGO called Citizens for Greener Caribbean. I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation, um, Professor Bell Antoine. And it was interesting for me to hear you speak about us outgrowing our constitutions. The interesting thing is that we don't even know what we've outgrown. <laughs> so you spoke about engaging the, the wider public. And I tried to do a little bit of that, um, or a lot of it. Sometimes I find myself going on, and I'm not trying to toot my own trumpet or anything, but I find myself going to a drug block in, in Grandy where I live um, and speaking about what's in our constitution to people who are actually selling drugs and things right there. And the thing is, they're surprised and shocked. Mm -hmm. And they feel a sense of empowerment when you take out this document that looks a little bit yellow because it's old. And they hold it and I say, this is what, const you know, this is the constitution, this has all of your rights in it. Mm -hmm. and the power that comes with just a little bit of that information, but the general average man on the street has no idea what's in the Constitution, number one. And number two, when we talk about outgrowing this thing, we don't even know what we've outgrown. We talk about constitutional reform from time to time, but we don't even know what's in it. So what is there to reform? So as you start speaking about international norms and international laws, getting, you know, um, being able to, 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 to 
you know, go into the minds of, of the masses so that when we hear about an issue, we're not anti the issue. We, we, we are in a place where we can take it in and massage it and masticate it and come up with something sensible. We aren't there yet. Only the lawyers know what the rights are. But everybody needs to know what they are. So I just want to thank you for that. And I, I have a special interest in um, environmental law because I think environmental issues are human rights issues. Of course. So I, I want to talk to you about that at some point. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would like, my name is John Laguerre. I would like to be enlightened on a view I hear often expressed, not sometimes publicly, but privately, that um, legal norms, and that there cannot be a system of universal rights or universal legal norms, because the circumstances and level of development and the nature of the social structure will differ between one country from another. And I recall my former professor, Professor Lloyd Braffitt, always reminded us that methods of social control will be different for different societies. And I recall from my own researches on West Africa, a Ghanaian lawyer many years ago exclaiming that the British introduced crime to Africa because their norms and legal and conception of legal rights were totally different from those obtained in the Good morning, I'm Tyrone Marcus, Ministry of Sport Legal Department. One of the questions I wanted to ask um, Professor Bellantwine, and thanks for the the contribution. Uh, interestingly, the Ministry of Sport is close to bringing anti-doping legislation um, before the Parliament. And at the European level, uh, in particular, and especially North America, um, there is one school of thought within academic circles that human rights has become an obstacle to the fight against doping. And it's because of this, this delicate balance that has to be struck. So for instance, the athletes who are the, at the top level they go into something which is called a registered testing pool. And they have an obligation 365 days a year to disclose their whereabouts for at least 60 minutes. If they are not in that location when the drug tester comes to them, that is strike one. And if, if you get three strikes in an 18-month period, you can actually be banned for two years. So this top-level athlete, you Usain Bolt or Richard Thompson, for instance, they literally have to let somebody else know where they can be found every single day of the year. But what happens is that because of the prevalence of drug use in sport, the drug regulators are saying, hey, it is the out of competition testing that will help us to keep the integrity of sport. So on one hand, you need this to be able to regulate drug use in sport, but then on the other hand, you have a clear, or what seems to be a clear breach of privacy, in fact, it's one of the reasons why our legislation, when it, it, it has to be laid, will be special majority, simply because of the, the potential breaches of Section 4 and 5 of the Constitution. So I'm just wondering, one, whether that balance can be struck, if you think. <laughs> and uh, do you anticipate that maybe some of these drug cases will eventually reach some of our, our regional courts? Thank you. I have no doubt they will reach, but it's not, um, a pic it's not something peculiar to drugs. I mean, there are many, many examples where human rights, depending on your point of view, serves an obstacle. Let's start with terrorism. I mean, one we live with every day. I mean, rights of privacy, self-incrimination, any area we go to. But the question is, what's the alternative? Do you whittle away rights to the extent that you never, it's like, when we talk about our system of justice and you say you're innocent until proven guilty, people say, oh, but they know they're guilty. So do you have a, an alternative system and say, okay, just assume people are guilty? So it's, it's that kind of thing that you start off with the preservation of human rights 
And we have all these fancy principles today, proportionality and all of that. And then as you correctly identify, try to get a balance and you know, thankfully that's not me, that's these guys in front of here, these uh, honorable judges who have to look at this from a case to case basis. But you can't start off saying, okay, forget about rights, we wanna get drugs. You know, it, it is essentially a balance at the end of the day. I, I would it'd be nice if one of the judges would comment on that. Day. My name is Anne Marie Bicessa. I must commend you, and I look forward to this thing getting some teeth and being accepted in country. To me, sometimes the common law or the law of the land does not protect its people. For instance, in cases of bullying, bullying at the workplace, bullying outside the workplace, the glass ceiling as I see it is still alive and well. The law does not deal with that. It means to say that in a many cases, females are deprived and denied basic and fundamental rights. The right to move ahead, the right to stop being bullied, and the law does not deal with it. There must be somebody, and I hope that your, that will be your body, to look at extending rights, not only for the death penalty, but mm -hmm. for women and for children who I think we are neglected and voiceless in societies such as ours. Because this is a patriarchal society. It's a patriarchal organization. It's patriarchal in terms of how you get opportunities and you are denied. And when you talk about it, people will say, what is it she trying to see? And they will laugh at it. But I think having a body there and people adhering to that body I think it will push us in a very, very different direction so far as females and children are concerned. And I look forward to you going forward. I commend you. Thank you. We have, we have five more minutes in case anyone else would like to make a comment or ask a question, and then we'll take a break at 11 to return at 11.15. Morning, uh, Colin Robinson. I had a question about the Commonwealth Caribbean's traditional legal framework of dualism where we enact in domestic law um, human rights agreements that we've um, <laughs> entered into. And I wanted you to comment more broadly on that. I also wanted to draw Mr. Harry Paul into that discussion if I could as well in terms of the role, for example, of his LRC in um, that process. Okay, um, the first point you raised, what happens in our system, our, which we inherited from the good old Britain, um, we do not accept that international law is directly enforceable in our legal system. Justice Witt, I'm sure, he'll want to make a comment about this because he comes from a civil law tradition. We belong to the common law legal tradition. He is him coming from Suriname, which has a different, and uh, being on OCCJ, they have the opposite philosophy. When they sign a treaty, it's directly enforceable. With us, we have to go further and enter a process called incorporation, where we write the law into our own domestic law. Having said that, um, there are um, ways in which it can come in indirectly, let's say, especially if there's a gap in the law. If there's no clear principle, um, you can rely more directly on international law, as sometimes there isn't in constitutional jurisprudence. Or we also talk about being influenced, the courts being influenced, or the system being influenced. But strictly speaking, you, you couldn't or shouldn't just simply enforce um, a treaty provision, as the case may be. All right, so that causes a conflict um, in our legal system, and I suppose in the minds of the layperson too, because they see us signing all of these fancy conventions and they want to remember we have those rights. But there's a further step to be taken. Um, I don't know, Justice Wiss, do you want to comment, please, coming from a different perspective, a Suriname perspective, and the, the pitfalls of our own system? Thank you. Well, I have given my view on, on, this, uh, on this issue. 
in Joseph and Boyce, and I stand by that view. Um, clearly, um, it is absurd uh, to have this extreme form of dualism, because we talk about dualism, but there are several forms of it. And uh, what you inherited from the British is, is an extreme form of dualism, uh, which leads to absurdities before, because uh, common law, uh, or let me say customary international law, is considered to be part of your common law. So it can be applied. Now, what is customary international law? That's something you had nothing to say about. You had no influence about it, uh, in it. You didn't sign anything. It's there and you have to apply it, and the judge can apply it as common law. Now you have a treaty, you sign it, you ratify it, but you cannot apply it as a judge or as, as, as a lawyer. That, that, that is an absurdity, and it is an unnecessary absurdity. Now, the difference between the monist and the dualist system is not a philosophy. It is simply how do you uh, look at your constitution? For example, the Dutch constitution or the Sudanese constitution is monist because the constitution says so. Uh, it simply says before you ratify a treaty, you get the approval from parliament. And once you get the approval from parliament, you ratify the treaty. And then those provisions which can be applied directly can be applied by any judge. Uh, so if there is any judicial reform to suggest, I would say, well, uh, put that in your constitution, let parliament decide whether to ratify a treaty, you have involvement of parliament, and therefore once you ratify with the approval of, of parliament, it becomes law. That is, in a very short words, uh, I think one should do. Hi, thank you. <coughs> um, I just wanted to raise a question with I will, I will, I will. But first, I want to ask a question of Dr. Alpha. In, in light of the <coughs> mechanism to enforce human rights in the Commonwealth Caribbean, particularly Trans Tobago with its constitutional um, enforcement mechanism, together with Professor Laguerre setting the EUC and the EOT there, <coughs> do you think there is a need for a separate independent Human Rights Commission's board or body in the region, for, ex for example, Trans Tobago, to deal with and the enforcement? Well, particularly trying to be able to deal specifically with the enforcement of human rights, separate and apart from what exists currently. That's one. Two, um, just a comment um, to let Dr. Bissessa know that at the moment, within probably another two weeks, the Law Reform Commission will complete its working paper on bullying, both in school and in the workplace, to go out for public comment. Secondly, we are also doing a special, a special paper dealing with women's commission to deal with the issue of human rights and women in the society at broad end. And thirdly, we are actually looking at a new bill to deal with human rights, the enforcement of human rights. And in fact, that's why I premised that earlier question to you, whether an independent human rights commission is necessary. It's a question we are grappling with at the moment, a working paper and a draft bill based on the Canadian model has been prepared. Um, so I just wanted to share that with those present in relation to what the commission is currently undertaking among its many projects. Um, but it was my understanding that Trinidad had an independent law, um, but I certainly in terms of the Equality, the Equality Op Op Opportunity Act, maybe it's very limited, but we already have that. Um, and I know I don't really believe that the answer is to have another commission. I don't know about other people, but I'm not a kind of committee person, me, 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 I suppose, although I'm on this committee now. But I, I just believe we have to go out there and, you know, Im as I said, engage in dialogue with the people. The ones we have, let's make it more effective. Let's, without being cheesy, let's strengthen it. Uh. Um, I'm afraid that we'd have to end uh, this session, which I, I know many people still wanted to make comments or have questions, but we can continue it in the coffee break. The coffee break is downstairs towards the end of the corridor. It's the launch, and we'd like to resume at 11.15. So I'd like to thank um, Professor Antoine on your behalf again for this <laughs> session this morning. Uh,
I'm in the middle by the flowers. Where am I? Here? I'll go to the I think that. Don't do so well. I always want your own uh, when I'm standing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to want to stand the table. Me. Um, I have to give women a voice. <laughs> Margaret, I really want to address where to speak from. What? Where you want to speak from? Speak from the table or the podium? I'll stand. I feel the same. Where are the outlines? <laughs> I want to pretend to be a judge and stay on the bench. I'm sorry, <laughs> Well, good morning. Uh, we're now about to um, have discussion on strengthening the inter American human rights system with respect to the Caribbean. And I'm very pleased to participate in this discussion. Um, as you heard earlier today, the discussion is timely, as there are many challenges facing the region. I would add uh, challenges and opportunities facing the region. I think the system has played an important role in the past. And one of the issues which I would stress was that in the region, it has helped to remove the concept of impunity for serious and gross human rights violations. But I think it has also helped to inform the establishment of mechanisms that will improve the quality of human existence. As we reflect on that and look forward to the future, I would think that the most obvious issue for the future in, in our region is the issue of universality and encouraging full participation of CARICOM in the system. Now, my task as moderator is made very easy by the high quality of the discussants that will take you through the issues and eventually respond to your questions and commentaries. We hope that this will be an interactive session and that you will engage the panelists. The session will commence with a presentation by the international law professor, Dinah Shelton, of the, American, of the George Washington University Law School. And she's also the immediate past president of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and is currently the rapporteur for all CARICOM states except Haiti. I, with great pleasure, invite Professor Shelton to present. Thank you, Justice Byron. I'd like to acknowledge the representative of the Attorney General's Office, uh, representatives of our host institution here, uh, fellow commissioners, justices of the uh, <coughs> courts, both courts that are represented here, fellow lawyers and students of the law. I'd like to thank you very much for the opportunity of being here. It's a particular honor and pleasure to return to Trinidad and Tobago in the year that you are celebrating your 50 years of independence. It's not often I visit a country younger than I am. Um, <laughs> it's a little disconcerting, I must say. Um, but uh, it is also a great honor to be in a country that is a participant in the inter-American human rights system. When we speak about universality, it is sometimes overlooked that the commission was created slightly longer ago, but not by much, uh, to the independence of Trinidad and Tobago for the promotion and protection of human rights in every OAS member state. Our jurisdiction is universal. And <clears throat> as
as the Caribbean countries have become members of the OAS, it is also of often overlooked what an important regional bloc it is. And I often do a count of this just to make this point that of the 34 currently active members of the OAS, we have one Portuguese speaking country that's a little bit of um, on its own, Brazil. And if we look at the membership of the rest of the OAS, CARICOM plus the United States and Canada constitute 16 of the um, <coughs> member states. Spanish speaking countries are 17. In other words, countries with English speaking common law traditions are about an equal membership in the OAS. You have a tremendously important role to play throughout uh, the strengthening process, and I hope that the region will become extremely active in doing this. So as I mentioned, the Commission is about the same uh, age, a little bit older <coughs> than Trinidad and Tobago, but the first major crisis the Commission faced was exactly the year of your independence, 1962, when the Commission got involved in a crisis then in the Dominican Republic. Now, since that time, the Commission began actively operating in 1960. Like every institution that humans created, it's <laughs> undergone a process of evolution and a process of change. And it is an ever-present task to try to find more effective and efficient ways to strengthen the promotional and protective activities of the Commission. So we've undergone several reform processes, several major changes in our rules procedure since our creation. Just five years after the Commission started functioning in 1965, the statute was reformed to give the Commission explicit power to receive petitions alleging human rights violations by any member state in the hemisphere. That necessitated a whole new set of rules of procedure on how petitions would be dealt with. When the convention entered into force in 1978, again we had to undergo a major change in our rules of procedure to deal with the uh, commencing of the operations of the court and the entry into force of the convention. So that was a second major revision of the rules of procedure. We did another major revision in 2001. And then beginning <clears throat> in 2011, we started to look at some other needs that had arisen. We were made aware of the fact that our executive secretary would be leaving after more than 10 years on the commission. The function of appointing a secret, uh, an executive secretary belongs to the secretary general of the organization, but it has always been done with input from the commission. Yet our rules of procedure did not set out any procedure for the selection of the new executive secretary. So we began a process of cons consultations with governments, with civil society on how that should uh, take place. Um, and we also drafted a strategic plan for the next five years. The Commission faces a number of challenges and has faced these challenges since the beginning, but they become more critical as the workload increases, which the workload has. First of all, the Commission is not a full-time body, nor is the Inter-American Court. We serve in our personal capacities. We meet for six to seven weeks a year weeks. And in that process, we have to monitor the human rights of 35 member states in the OAS. We have to undertake promotional activities. And we all have to have jobs that pay us because the OAS doesn't. So we are working part time for the commission, trying to put in as much time as we can. We rely heavily on our secretariat. We are very, very interested and concerned in maintaining the independence and autonomy, not only of each member of the Commission, but members of the Secretariat as well. Now, the process of the uh, transition from the former Executive Secretary to the present Executive Secretary led to many discussions with the member states of the OAS, 
who were raising concerns about some other issues as well. And this led, <clears throat> as the representative of Ecuador mentioned, to a <clears throat> decision that was taken at the OAS General Assembly to have a working group to consider a number of issues arising about strengthening the system. Uh, and the issues that arose run a huge spectrum of, and I would agree with Rosemary Antoine, some issues that reflect um, concerns of governments who have been criticized for their human rights performance. No government likes to be accused of human rights violations. It gets media attention, it creates problems for them in their domestic political agenda, it may interfere with projects that they have underway. Uh, and it's natural perhaps to defend by accusing the accusers. So we have faced some problems from governments who have been concerned about uh, <clears throat> accusations of human rights violations and findings of human rights violations. At the same time, the Commission does have problems uh, as the workload increases, petitions get slowed down. We don't have the resources that are necessary to deal with every issue in a timely manner. Fifty-five percent of our budget comes from external sources. The OAS has not increased the budget commensurate with the tasks that are being given to the OAS, or to the Commission. <laughs> so some of the pressure for strengthening came from states that want to see increased resources given to the Commission. It's not only those that are concerned about uh, the Commission's own findings, but it's also those who genuinely want to see the Commission strengthened. So over the process of the last year, <clears throat> the Permanent Council of the Commission uh, has been engaged in uh, holding a series of meetings. There have been um, uh, more than two dozen of these meetings, um, <clears throat> many of them in consultation with the Commission, and members of the Commission have also met with sub-regional groups. We've met bilaterally with different governments and this series of consultations is being held. And the working group of the Permanent Council, or the working group set up pursuant to the General Assembly resolution, has looked at a number of issues. One of these has now been resolved. It was the issue of the appointment of the new Executive Secretary of the Commission. The rule was adopted, the rule is in force, and the rule was applied in the selection of our new Executive Secretary. We're also, they're, the, they're also reviewing our strategic plan for the medium and long-term goals of the Commission. And then some other specific issues have arisen. Uh, the precautionary measures that Commissioner Antoine mentioned. Under what constitutes the imminent threat of irreparable harm or serious and urgent situations that justify the issuance of precautionary measures? Should they have an automatic termination date, or should they be reviewed, and if so, how often? <clears throat> how can we more efficiently process individual cases, make the criteria for admissibility more widely known? Can we increase our involvement in reaching friendly settlements, something that we have done successfully in a number of countries. I participated in quite a few of these negotiations in Paraguay last year. We successfully resolved a number of cases with a very large number of victims uh, who received redress as a result. Uh, <clears throat> chapter four, uh, we always refer to chapter four. It is a big issue in the discussion with governments. Why? Well, chapter four, for the last couple of decades, uh, appears in our annual report each year. And it is the chapter in which we signal to the states, the member states, what we believe are the situations that are the most urgent and most serious in the hemisphere for them to take action. We can't enforce human rights. It is up to the political bodies to enforce human rights. But we have to tell them what situations are deserving of their attention. 
since we have these cases that come in on a regular basis, we are able to observe the situation in different countries. We set out at the beginning of chapter four the criteria that are applied in deciding whether to put a country situation into chapter four. Uh, it can be an emergency as a result of a natural disaster. Everyone agreed following Haiti's massive earthquake, there were serious, we hope temporary, emergency human rights situations occurring in Haiti that demanded the attention and support of other member states. So Haiti appeared in chapter four after the earthquake occurred. It can be the result of a coup d'etat that stops democratic processes. So after the 2009 coup in Honduras, Honduras appeared in chapter four. It can be the result of, a, <coughs> of findings that there are systematic human rights violations. The kinds of things that also lead the United Nations to appoint rapporteurs to undertake an investigation of a particular country. Countries don't really like to appear in chapter four. Uh, Haiti may be the exception because it was a way of mobilizing support for Haiti and there was no allegation that Haiti had somehow triggered the earthquake. So, but in other instances where appearance in chapter four is based on findings of violations, uh, the response can be and has been on the part of some countries highly negative. There <coughs> have been concerns that the sources of information the commission relies on have not been set forth. Last year we began to set forth in order on which we look at them what it is that we look at in deciding whether to put a country in chapter four. The very first thing we look at are official pronouncements of the government and often that is enough to make the decision. So if a government is engaged in dismantling an independent judiciary that is in and of itself something that we would look at. We look at official reports of the United Nations, of other countries, uh, and we go down the list then, and at the very bottom are NGO and, and media reports. That is not our primary source of information. Uh, <coughs> we also look at the cases and petitions that have been filed within the system. So <laughs> chapter four is one of the major issues that uh, <coughs> we are looking at in cooperation uh, with the political bodies. Promotion of human rights. We have the mandate to promote as well as to protect. How can we do more promotion? How can we get more involved? On-site missions are the best manner we have of finding out what's going on in a country, but they cost money. And if we don't have the funding, we can't get into the country, we can't do seminars like this, uh, we can't do friendly settlements on site. So it comes back again to the resources issue. Uh, <coughs> and to the credit of the working group, financial strengthening of the system is one of the major issues that is being considered uh, in the recommendations going forward. <coughs> now the, um, in this series of meetings, the, I think the one procedural part of it that the commission feels was not adequately dealt with was civil society participation. Because in the two dozen meetings the Permanent Council held on strengthening, only one of them invited civil society organizations to participate and the amount of time given to them to make their views known was extremely limited. So in the seminars that we are holding around the hemisphere, we are trying to fill that gap by opening up to civil society, and we will do so again in, at the opening of our session at the end of October. So we are trying to get as much information as we can about what are perceived to be the weaknesses in the system that could be improved, uh, what other kinds of changes we might make, to make both the promotional and protective systems uh, more efficient and more effective. So <clears throat> in terms of the recommendations that um, have been made, uh, as I said, the, the Article 11 issue about the executive secretary process, that has now been resolved, it is completed. 
In terms of other recommendations, <clears throat> the starting point, and I don't think anyone on the commission disagrees with this, is that the promotion and protection of human rights is primarily the responsibility of the governments of the member states. We are subsidiary. We exist as the regional safety net in case that responsibility is not carried forward. The recommendations recognize again, very importantly, the autonomy and independence of the commission. Um, and it's very useful to talk about the, uh, also the <coughs> uh, dialogues that we have had, the clarifications. Our annual report has gotten so big that I really don't think many of the delegations actually read it, so this is an opportunity to make things now. So the challenges that were set forth uh, by the working group, what they see as the major challenges, are achieving universality. Now, as I said, the commission has universality. So when the uh, working group is mentioning universality, what they are really meaning is ratification of the treaties. Not simply the American Convention, but the Convention Against Torture, uh, the Convention on Violence Against Women, the Disappearances Convention, there's about half a dozen of them now. And this is a problem that is not unique to CARICOM. Every time I talk to the State Department or to members of the U.S. Senate, I say, I don't care which treaty you pick, pick one of them. You know, the Violence Against Women Convention is almost identical to U.S. federal legislation. Ratify it. Start showing that you are a part of this system and that you are not simply going to sit back and have the commission apply the declaration to you. Uh, several governments, and I think it's important to point this out here, several governments have proposed that by 2019, the 50th anniversary of the convention, no state that is not a party to the convention can have a member of the commission or the court. Okay. Um, now, normally you wouldn't have a non-party on the court anyway, but it has happened in the past that Costa Rica nominated someone from the United States who served on the court. But that means that this will become, the commission and the court will become exclusively uh, entities made up of states that have ratified the convention, but they will still be applying human rights law to non-parties. Okay. So this is viewed in, in a way as a kind of sanction. Um, and <clears throat> that proposal doesn't appear in the recommendations, but it is certainly there in the discussion. Compliance. Compliance with the recommendations, with the decisions of the, of the commission and on the one hand and the court on the other. Balancing from, uh, promotion and protection, improving procedures, making the process work speedily, but also equitably. We don't want speed at the cost of reaching uh, well-reasoned decisions. Uh, <clears throat> and ensuring adequate funding for the organization as a cross-cutting challenge that affects everything else that has been said here. So some of the recommendations are given to the commission, some are given to the member states, uh, and um, uh, in all, all of this package will be going uh, to a special session of the General Assembly that is to be convened in the first quarter of 2013. So at that point, we will see what, uh, if any, changes are made to the basic uh, instruments. Uh, <clears throat> now, I would mention just one of the specific recommendations that appears here because it relates to a question that was asked earlier, and that is the question of the, rap the rapporteurships on the commission. All of our rapporteurships except uh, <laughs> one uh, are held by members of the commission. We have one rapporteurship that has uh, received sufficient external funding that it is held by a person who's not a member of the commission and that is the rapporteurship on freedom of expression. That rapporteurship has been extremely active, is totally supported by the commission, uh, <coughs> but it has nonetheless uh, had considerable criticism of its activities and 
uh, particularly the fact that it issues a separate report from our annual report each year. So one of the recommendations is to put uh, all of the reports of the rapporteurships within our annual report, which would make it about a 5,000 page document that no one would ever look at. So it's, it raises some issues of practicality, but I would signal that that rapporteurship is a particularly contentious issue at the present time. So I will stop there. I've given you a lot of issues to think about in terms of where this strengthening process is at the current time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Shelton. I think your very interesting and enlightening discussion has highlighted the management problems which we face. Because the, as you would imagine, the issues that uh, could be addressed in a discussion of this nature are quite extensive. <coughs> and we have here um, panelists who are practitioners in the system whose heart is full of things to speak about. As we move on to the second phase of the panel discussion, I'm going to introduce the panelists in the order in which they will speak. They will each speak for about eight minutes or so. And after that, we will then open the floor for um, questions and discussion. We have Dr. Hans Gieser, who is a senior fellow at the Institute of International Relations at U University of the West Indies. He worked in the field at the service of the United Nations for some 30 years and has written extensively on human rights and sustainable development of small island developing states. Dr. Giza. Um, secondly, we will have Dr. Arif Volkan. Um, he is a lecturer at the Faculty of Law at the St. Augustine campus of the University of the West Indies. And among other things, he has a very strong research interest in the land rights of indigenous peoples. Then we have Mr. Colin Robinson, who is the executive director of the Coalition Advo Advocating for the Inclusion of Sexual Orientation. Now, he's a Barbadian, but the name of the organization is Kaizo. <laughs> you know, Daniel? Oh, 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 right. So that is why, but he sounded Barbadian when he spoke to me. <laughs> but, but, but no, no, but, but he's the executive director of Kaizo. This is a non-profit organization working to mainstream sexual and gender diversity in Trinidad and Tobago. Then we have Mr. Douglas Mendes, senior counsel a senior attorney at law in Trinidad and Tobago. He is also the honorary counsel of the International Planned Parenthood Federation. And he is a judge on the Belize Court of Appeal. And um, the lady, <laughs> the very distinguished and attractive lady Judge Margaret McCauley, <laughs> who is a judge of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and an, an attorney at law in Jamaica. She has had a very distinguished and diverse career. Uh, but relevant for today, she has an intimate knowledge of the inter-American human rights system and its processes and is deeply involved in it. Now, I ask the panelists to come forward in order as a player on the program. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends, Mr. Chairman, moderator, I uh, have to start off with three preliminary remarks. One, you notice that I talk about friends and colleagues. 
And that simply shows that they have been corrupted by 30 years of UN <laughs> service because we always made a distinction between friends and colleagues. <laughs> friends you choose, colleagues you have no choice. I know that here we are friends and we don't go any further than friendship. Secondly, I must tell you that yes, I am of Swiss origin. Nobody is perfect. <laughs> but I have lived and labored in the UN system all the way through, always with a special emphasis on the promotion of human rights and also a special emphasis on the CARICOM region, which for me is a very dear region and to which I have been attached to since the early years. I don't dare to tell you how long I have been here. And thirdly, I would simply ask for forgiveness, Chairman, that you pronounce my name as Kiese, while it is Kaiser. But again, this happens in the Caribbean. People call you Kiese, even my own wife, who is, <laughs> who is Trinidadian, she calls me Kiese. Now, this being said, let me also add that I am not, I am not a specialist of the inter-American human rights system. Although, of course, I have studied it, I have partly practiced it out of my occupation with the UN, but <coughs> my experience really, and when we talk about strengthening the human rights system, comes from the background that I have with the United Nations, where I was for a long time in charge of the human rights program adopted by the UN General Assembly, where I was, in, among other things, running workshops all over Asia, Latin America, Africa, the Caribbean, on human rights reporting and reforming the reporting process. I would also say that in my very late years, I was also responsible for the regional office, CARICOM office, of the International International Red Cross uh, Committee, in the ICRC, and in that um, a capacity also, we did a lot of promotional work, more so maybe of the international humanitarian law, rather than just focusing strictly on human rights and civil and political rights. Now, what I learned in my work in promoting the human rights system are a number of challenges which we just heard from Professor Robinson. Um, <coughs> one is apathy. I'm trying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. One is apathy. Okay. Yeah, I, I was looking at, at Tracy. One is uh, apathy, one at times is hostility, and one at, one at time is simply ignorance. Ignorance by the key stakeholders of the human rights system. And here I'm speaking about the human rights, international human rights system. In the Caribbean, we have most countries, CARICOM states, have adopted, ratified the international human rights instruments. There are about seven of them, civil, political, economic, social, and cultural, rights of the child, um, rights of the woman, um, <coughs> migrant worker, there, was, there are seven of them, UN instruments. If you go, and I have been doing that from country to country, from government to government, and ask them, what about implementing? They will tell you, yeah, you know, we're implementing, implementing. After all, we have signed the thing. What else you want? And what they do not understand is that by signing and ratifying, they assume obligations implementing obligations which they have to carry out. And that is where the, the problem lies, here in this region. Trinidad and Tobago has made, in that respect I must say, has made some progress. Trinidad and Tobago has, first of all, after many, many years, 
enacted an implementation legislation on the Geneva Convention, humanitarian law. Trinidad and Tobago has implemented the, the Rome Statute on the International Criminal Court. Trinidad and Tobago has implemented, hopefully, almost completely now, the International Convention on the Right of the Child, which is not the case in many other, in many other uh, uh, CARICOM states. And that is one item where I think here in this gremium we have to address how to overcome the, you call it apathy, you call it ignorance, you call it lower priority of the international human rights system. And that, of course, applies as well to the uh, inter-American system, quite clear. <coughs> What we have been doing in the UN, <coughs> and that makes us maybe different from the inter-American system, that under each covenant, under each treaty, we have a supervisory body, a committee, human rights committee, for all the seven, which is periodically reporting to the, com uh, uh, receives report by the state parties and the government uh, on how they have been doing in terms of implementation. And this, of course, unfortunately, we do not have that system in the inter-American system. There is no such thing as an individual reporting on the ge uh, general convention on the number, number of uh, protocols, including, including the protocol on economic, social, and cultural right, um, <coughs> which has been adopted in uh, San uh, in, in um, Anyway, it's, a, it's one of the instruments that has been adopted by the, um, the, 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 con the, the, the convention, which is att attached to the convention. To that extent, we are not in the same situation, obviously. Now, if you ask what kind of promotion, strengthening effort we should do, we could carry out in the Latin American region in the inter-American system. Um, <coughs> many of the proposals have just been mentioned and I think uh, no, no point of repe repeating them. My personal suggestion, and this is based on the experience that I had, is that what is needed really is a very deliberate, ongoing effort to uh, involve, first of all, governments lobby with the governments at the highest possible level, then also involve NGOs and the media in particular. And for instance, I don't know that you would have to tell me whether this is feasible that one really would push in the case of Trinidad and Tobago for a reaccession of the convention by the government of Trinidad and Tobago. I read this as 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I will stop. Um, there are a number of other proposals which I have. I think the re, um, petition guidelines should need to be revised and reviewed and adopted and promoted. People don't know what, is, uh, what the, 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 the petition sy system is all about. I would also have place and say that there is more emphasis more on some of the additional protocols, not only on death penalty and not only on the civil and political rights. There are other human rights which usefully be, can be promoted through the, the, the system. Um, <coughs> and this, I guess, is, I will stop here. Um, I told you I'm from Switzerland, so I, I was going according to Swiss time. Thank you. <laughs> Don't start timing it. Don't start timing it. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioners, judges, colleagues, students, Friends, very good day to you all. 
I'd like to begin by thanking the Commission for inviting me to speak today. And a brief apology, I came in later, not that anyone would have noticed, but I say it only because if I repeat anything that was said by my colleague and dear friend, Rosemary, um, forgive me, um, I missed her presentation. Um, on the upside, it's only eight minutes, which apparently goes by very fast. <laughs> I, on the subject of strengthening the inter-American human rights system and its mandate in the Caribbean, I'd like to begin, first of all, by acknowledging the work of the Commission. The Commission has an impressive and remarkable track record. And I'd like, to, I'd like to point to two things. One, its jurisprudence. And secondly, its influential political impact that it has had through its reporting, its country visits, and the reporting that has um, flowed from it. Um, with regard to the jurisprudence, if I could highlight a couple of things in the areas of criminal procedure and <coughs> due process requirements. Um, the Commission has made some innovations that are quite remarkable in terms of states' duties, uh, responsibilities to prote uh, protect, prosecute, and it has led to crucial reforms across Latin America in terms of nullification of amnesty laws. Notions of justice and rights and accountability in particular for marginalized communities, and I think here of like women, uh, indigenous peoples, um, standard setting in the areas of indigenous peoples. And so notable cases like coming out from, uh, in relation to Nicaragua, um, Paraguay, Suriname, and even Belize of, in the Commonwealth Caribbean, which in turn influenced the first and only successful case to date on indigenous land rights in the Commonwealth Caribbean. And then finally, its approach to remedies, which um, again goes beyond so, sort of reparations and, and compensations, um, but has encompassed two uh, suggestions for law reform, resulting in the famous, uh, in the Maria de Pena case, in the eponymous law in Brazil. Um, so its record in this area has been quite remarkable. It has contributed to the development of norms that I think um, that are relevant and applicable here. Uh, regarding the country visits, one commissioner, I think he was the president at one time, described the commission as a hemispheric grand, grand jury, uh, Tom Fira from, from the US. He described the commission as a hemispheric grand jury charging around the hemisphere and, and holding nations accountable. This is not rhetoric. Uh, when, when you compare, and you don't even have to compare it with, with comparable UN systems, like their 1503 or 1235 procedures, just on its own, the impact of the commission has been astounding, um, leading to high profile results throughout Latin America. There were, I think, notorious periods of m repression, uh, authoritarianism, um, but even more recently, I think apart from the 70s and 80s, and so you've had presidents like Samosa saying, well, um, I think in his memoirs or whatever, um, I resigned because uh, after the 1979 report in Nicaragua, same thing in very recently with Fujimori in 2000 after that report was released in Ottawa. So you actually have a commission um, whose work has led to substantial political consequences in domestic jurisdictions. Now, that's in Latin America. I think a bystander would be forgiven for being surprised that the system applies to the Commonwealth Caribbean. Um, and that we are subject to this universal jurisdiction that we heard about. Because I don't think it would be too harsh to describe uh, the commission's relationship or the system's relationship with the Anglophone Caribbean um, in the initial days as one of neglect. And when, it, when we did figure on the radar, relations were quite confrontational, particularly Trinidad. Um, so I know I, I must acknowledge that there, there were obvious reasons for this. You had human rights abuses or violations of a horrific scale in places like Guatemala, Argentina, and so on. And, and so perhaps there were reasons why the Commonwealth Caribbean didn't figure. But this doesn't mean that the Commonwealth Caribbean things have been rosy here. Um, and even during that period when, you, when the commission was occupied, legitimately so in Latin America, you had places like Grenada where Maurice Bishop's um, sorry, how could I, Eric Gehry's um, 
enforcement mechanisms. They said he received training from the Pinochet's, um, uh, Chile's Pin Pinochet's um, military. You had a period of repressive rule in Guyana and all the systemic um, results of that from, from the 60s onwards. So it was not that historically the Caribbean was immune. I think now looking forward, what are the areas, if, uh, what, what are the areas in which I think um, the Commission has a role to play I, in, in the Co Commonwealth Co Caribbean? And I'll mention them very briefly because it appears I'm out of time already. Um, democracy, strength, and this is very much what the Commission is about, democracy and strengthening the rule of law in Guyana. Um, the, I know the perception is with free and fair elections that, that that's democracy. Well, that isn't democracy. Um, in Guyana, you've had, first of all, I think concerns around linking democracy simply around elector elections, free and fair elections. And there are significant problems around marginalization of uh, African Guyanese. Um, you've, and, and this is well documented, the Guyana Human Rights Association um, has pointed out that over a period between 2000, 2002, 2006, 200 um, men of African descent were killed extrajudicially in Guyana. Now, 200 might not sound a lot to Latin Americans where you've had thousands of people in a village being killed, but in Guyana, where our population is less than a million and where Afro descendants account for less than 30 or less than 35 percent, that is a staggering figure. 200 people over, and, and that's a conserv conservative estimate. Um, the Commission, I think, has some kind of knowledge of this because the Commission recently issued a statement in relation to the um, killing of three peaceful protesters in a predominantly African mining town in Ghana, in Linden. The response of the government was, what? what where is this Commission coming from? Um, we never heard about the Commission before this. Um, the point is, it, led, it was part of a chorus that led to the appoint, appointment of a commission of inquiry into what's happened, happened in Linda, in that town, um, six or seven weeks ago. But a week ago, another young African-American, uh, African-Guyanese man was killed again, extrajudicially. So there are systemic problems around race and ethnicity in Guyana. Um, I think generally in the Caribbean, I think in, especially in the larger territories, there are problems around the administration of justice. This must have been evident from the slew of death penalty cases which revealed systemic problems with the criminal justice system. Things I'm talking about here like delayed trials and uh, efficiency of the system, um, uh, again, police conduct, um, prison conditions, and so on. The perception, the, the sometimes crude perception is human rights is about criminals charged, they're an obstacle. I heard that when I came in late. Human rights are an obstacle, they're not. Um, I think an acknowledgement of human rights and, and due process standards strengthens a domestic system and ensures that justice is fair and even-handed and equitable. Um, there are problems, I think, in, especially in the larger territories, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, as I said, evident from the communications procedures that show that there are systemic problems in administration of justice. Violence against women, very common problem, um, and indigenous rights. Um, I mentioned in Belize, um, first ever case uh, that I think was partially influenced by the um, Toledo case that the commission itself or the court dealt with. Um, but that's at one level. Implementation is another issue. And in Guyana and Belize, where there are significant indigenous populations, the problems are dire. It's, it's about, one, uh, recognition of, 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 of rights, um, land rights, resource use rights, and then there's about implementation on the ground. So across the board, there are serious problems. The Caribbean is not, the Caribbean, might, they might not be large scale violations, but there are several areas in which our human rights record uh, is far from desirable. Uh, I didn't mention HIV AIDS and all the problems that, that, that I think um, comes with that, like around discrimination, um, access to health, and so on. Now, finally, um, in terms of the commission, and, and, and I'm done in, in 30 seconds, um, I think the commission certainly needs to increase its presence in the Caribbean. Um, that's the obvious, but how do, I, how do, how do countries get signaled for, for com commission reports? Um, when I looked on the website preparing for this about the country reports, I saw not one report in relation to the um, English-speaking Caribbean. Now, maybe it hasn't been uploaded as yet, but um, 
uh, it suggests to me that um, there's a very sort of um, distant relationship still with the Commonwealth Caribbean. What is the representation within the commission? Now we have two of our, of, of our stellar um, Caribbean scholars on the commission, but elsewhere in the system, and I think, oops, I'm sorry, this is me, um, but elsewhere within the system in terms of staff, lawyers, and, and functioning, is it, is it overwhelmingly Latin American or is there a representation across the board? Um, I think institutional reforms, we can't talk about strengthening the system and bringing the Caribbean within the fold um, without acknowledging, as, as we heard, the enormous workload of the commission itself and the fact that the commission sits only part time. Um, the commission will only be able to deal with this increased workload then if the Caribbean comes on board fully, um, if with an infusion of financial and human resources um, uh, and, and to obviate the delays. And in terms of the procedural guidelines, I think things like around the compliance, um, I was thinking uh, and harmonization of, of procedures around petitions, but I'm sorry I'm out of time, but perhaps we can explore this in the in the question and answer. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thanks everybody for coming and thanks to the commissioners and the staff, all protocols observed. I wanted to use my few minutes to try and quickly hit on about five points. I want to talk about the strengthening process and civil society engagement in it to talk a little bit about, from my Trinidad and Tobago perspective and the work that I do about why a structure like the commission is really important. Um, but to talk about the more fundamental question about building a culture of human rights um, in the Commonwealth <coughs> Caribbean, both at the government and civil society um, levels, and then to give some closing remarks and touch on this notion of universality a little bit. Um, a coalition that my organization works through um, in the inter-American system that works on um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and tra transgender and intersex issues joined about 100 other groups to weigh in on this process itself um, with a strong appeal that it be transparent, consultative, consistent, and dynamic. Certainly, this meeting is an attempt to reach out to civil society groups but one of the key messages we wanted to send was that more needs to be done to have this process meaningfully include the inputs um, of civil society organizations and not just those in um, metropolitan areas um, throughout uh, the hemisphere. Um, we certainly have tried, and my colleague Fulade Mutota at WINAD um, certainly helped us try and attract more civil society folks here, and the commission reached out to us to do that but much more needs to be done to strengthen civil society participation in visioning the re-strengthening. Uh, I live in Trinidad and Tobago, a state where the key anti-discrimination statute expressly excludes sexual orientation. It doesn't just leave it out, it says it's not included. I live in a state where the constitution prevents colonial era laws from being challenged using the Bill of Rights of the Constitution. I live in a state where the independent body, the Equal Opportunity Commission, that's charged with oversight of equal opportunity and making policy and legislative recommendations to government about steps to address new areas of inequality and opportunity. Um, won't touch sexual orientation, deciding that it's a political issue. Um, I live in a state where legislators say, oh, the human rights abuses based on sexual orientation aren't documented. Nobody's reported them to the authorities, the same authorities that by statute criminalize some forms of same-sex activity, the same authorities that 25 years after independence criminalized for the first time the widest range of sexual activity in the region with some of the harshest penalties increased as, as recently as 2000. Those are some of the reasons why the work of the commission is compelling and important, uh, particularly in Commonwealth um, Caribbean states. It's important to, to look at some of the particular processes of the commission and ways to strengthen them. 
But I want to challenge the Commission to play a more active role in a process that's not its own, but needs to be done in partnership with institutions like the International Relations Institute here at the university, with civil society groups like mine and others, um, and in some ways with government. And that's building a culture of human rights, particularly um, in Commonwealth Caribbean territories. The civil society human rights defense frameworks that we have are extremely weak. There was a regional Caribbean social justice coalition for the Commonwealth that was championed by Barbadian legislator Mia Motley at a meeting that a number of us attended um, last year. That's not got off the ground. Um, when, when I approached the leading human rights organization locally to provide emergency representation for 13 young transgender people who were swept off the street using a 1920s vagrancy law on the Thursday of a long weekend and when they appeared in, in court on Monday, there was a headline already in the newspaper saying drag queens in court. The response I got was advise them to throw themselves on the mercy of the court. My organization, a small, young LGBT group and the Family Planning Association were the only two organizations, the only two domestic civil society groups that got engaged at all with Trinidad and Tobago's Universal Periodic Review. No other domestic organization submitted comments or lobbied in Geneva. Not uh, formally, there nothing was on the, okay, well, we we'll talk. You comments didn't show up on the website. All right, good to know. Um, the Catholic Commission for Social Justice did as well, apparently. Um, and even leading members of OBA have a diminished understanding of constitutional rights and protections. A leading senior counsel has written in the newspaper that lesbian sex is not criminalized, not true. Um, another one uh, encouraged us to use the Constitution to challenge um, the buggery law. Again, you know, something that's a bit of a challenge in itself. Um, so that's work that's critical and important to strengthening the human rights climate so that people begin to develop the capacity and the routines and the frameworks even to engage with what the commission can offer. And that's a task that certainly civil society has a role to play in, but the commission, not just through education, but through other kinds of lobbying uh, to fund uh, civil society human rights initiatives, to leverage uh, support, certainly there are needs for the commission's own infrastructure and work uh, from the secretariat, but also getting the secretariat to pay attention to the partnership and the infrastructure within civil society that goes hand in hand um, with uh, the work of the commission at case finding um, and at broader advocacy and at strengthening advocacy behind the commission's reports and findings with domestic governments. There are incredible openings in Trinidad and Tobago around human rights that have emerged, interestingly enough, um, and this is not a partisan statement, um, in the last couple of years. Uh, the Prime Minister and her government have positioned themselves in this su quite surprising way with a certain gravitas in relationship to human rights. They've spoken the language. They've gone to the um, UN Human Rights Council and said that they're committed to supporting the human rights of everyone, including the LGBT community. They've talked about the law being a dynamic process. They've talked about wanting to be leaders in the region um, in terms of uh, responding to the needs of citizens. They said that last year, October, in Geneva. The Prime Minister said that in her Independence Day address. Um, there are opportunities here to seize, to develop um, a culture of human rights. I want to steal a little time just to address a particularly problematic issue, this, the question of universality. And it's come up in my work in some fascinating ways. The uh, UN Ambassador of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Prime Minister's son, uh, in responding to St. Vincent's um, UPR review, pleaded for special small state conditionalities around meeting human rights obligations. Um, my pushback is to highlight the particular challenges faced by rights holders in small island developing states and the ways in which um, we make sure that complainants in a small town in St. Vincent um, can get access to human rights protections and the frameworks of the commission without being politically punished or stigmatized in those kinds of tight social networks they depend on emotionally and, and um, economically. 
So I had a few more things to say, but I got most of them out. Thank you very much. I think I want to give Hilaire my watch because I think his is running a bit too far. <laughs> <laughs> I want to premise my um, remarks by <clears throat> on an assumption that the inter-American system would be strengthened if the countries of the Commonwealth Caribbean all accede to the American Convention and to the jurisdiction of the American court. And against that backdrop, I want to address <coughs> some of the arguments which have emerged today, but they are wrong for a long time, as to why uh, our countries sh should not take that step. The first point that is made is that it, it is a depletion of our sovereignty. And I just want to make some very brief points. The first is that it is, of course, and it's obvious, it is an act of sovereignty to decide that you would accede to an international treaty. You do it voluntarily. Nobody forces you to do it. The second point is that as countries in the region, we already um, submit ourselves to the jurisdiction of the commission itself. We already submit ourselves to the jurisdiction of the United Nations Human Rights Council. And every uh, periodically, we prepare our reports and subject ourselves to examination as to whether our systems comply with the UN Convention. Uh, <clears throat> Barbados is a, a very good example of ceding, jurisdiction, ceding sovereignty to the extent that it is, I think, the only country in the region that has promised to uh, comply with orders of the, uh, the court, although it seems that it is slow to actually implement those orders, but nevertheless it is saying that it will. And one of the, I suppose, prime examples of, of giving up our sovereignty is that all of the countries in the region except three now have the Privy Council as our final appellate courts. That's a foreign court um, determining our law. So we are accustomed <coughs> to ceding juris um, um, sovereignty. So I really don't understand the argument. The other point, of course, is that we are not bound domestically by the, by the recommendations made by the Commission and not even by the orders made by the court. Although, of course, we are bound in international law by, by such orders. The other point that is made, and I think it was mentioned by Mr. Harry Paul today in, in one of his remarks was well, if we have a constitution and a written bill of rights and we have a functioning and independent judiciary, why do we need another tier of, of review? And uh, <coughs> I think the, the answer to that is, that there are a number of answers to that. And the first is that when we participate in the system, we strengthen the moral authority of the commission and the court in relation to countries that may not be um, as, as good as we are at complying with, with human rights requirements. The second is that there are, and I think that Dr. Bulkan was pointing, pointing out to this, that there are violations of human rights that are so at, on such a large scale that it is not, it is not possible within the domestic legal system to correct them. And therefore, you would need a body outside of our countries in order to address these and, 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 and to highlight and publicize the violations that are taking place. Uh, <coughs> we also therefore not assume that the level of, of protection will always be effective. And in fact, in our countries, we have savings law clauses that pr prevent the local courts from reviewing colonial, legislation, uh, colonial laws that might violate human rights so that we still need a light to be shone on our, our systems in order to um, unearth these violations of human rights. Um, and I don't think that we should be so naive to think that the protections that we have become accustomed to now will always be so. There are many countries in the world who start off um, on the right track but end up in, in disaster. So I think that it is always important that we subject ourselves to, international, to the scrutiny of the international community, and that is, it, in effect, <coughs> what it is. 
Of course, the, the elephant in the room is the death penalty and delay. And <coughs> it is no secret, everybody knows, that Trinidad and Tobago and Jamaica um, came out of the American Convention because they perceived that the Commission and the Court were preventing them from carrying out the death penalty because of the Pratt and Morgan decision which set the five-year time limit. Well, they are <coughs> Trinidad came out in, in 1998, and since then I, there have been developments. Uh, the Privy Council in Thomas and Batiste, <coughs> first of all, struck down a, a timetable that had been set by the government, not because it was prohibited from setting timetables at all, but because the timetable that was set was unreasonable. In other words, the time period that was allowed for petitions was just simply too short. In any event, there um, a, a, seems to be a, a, a difference in opinion as to what the Privy Council is actually saying because in Thomas and Batiste, they also said that delay above 18 months will not count, but they seem to contradict themselves in an earlier case and, and in a later case of Lewis, which was pointed out by the CCJ themselves. And it's interesting to know that the CCJ has taken the position that as far as delay is concerned, you don't count delay above 18 months either. So I suppose one way to get around the question of delay is to accede to the appellate jurisdiction of the CCJ because um, delay before the commission will not be taken into account. So that's another easy way to do it. So it's very easy in, in, my, in my view to get around this question of delay posed by petitions to the Privy Council, to the um, commission. Um, and, but it's simply not <coughs> looked at in, in, in any um, seriousness. And it, of course, is a pity that all citizens of, of the region are denied access to the, to the Inter-American Court and to the jurisprudence under the American Convention simply because of death penalty cases and simply because of questions of delay. And in, I should point out that in most of the Eastern Caribbean where you don't have a mandatory death penalty anymore, and that there are few death sentences um, handed down because the court is reserving the death penalty. The courts are reserving the death penalty for the worst of the worst cases, for those cases where uh, <coughs> the convict is, fo is found to be incapable of rehabilitation. We haven't found such a case as yet in the last ten years, I think, that the question of the death penalty and the commission really is now a, a dead issue. Mm -hmm. So there's really no reason <coughs> for all of the countries, probably except Trinidad and Tobago, where we steadfastly hold on to the mandatory death penalty, not to accede to the, to the convention and to the jurisdiction of the, um, the court itself. Dead on time. <laughs> <laughs> Stand, even though I sit in the court, um, it's not my comfortable position to be in. Um, it, don't start counting until I. Could you please hold the paper up when I finish each minute? Yes. <laughs> Keep me on my toes. <laughs> I am just going to have some put forward some ideas and some muse, some thoughts which have occurred to me in the years I've been in the court and have been engaged in the system. Um, and in relation to the commission and the difficult job that the commission has been performing all these years, I mean, it is quite clear. I, I, I beg your pardon. May I? just say protocols observed to everyone, and thank you for having me. It is quite clear that the Commission has, to use a Jamaican expression, and is, being given a basket to carry water. <laughs> because how, really, they have been performing miracles over the years because of the financial resources which and human resources, which is based on the financial resources, which they've had to deal with and continue to deal with. And there's been such an increase 
in the use of the system and the process that clearly I don't see how they do it personally. We sit longer, a longer period in the court uh, and we have trouble keeping up with the cases you send to us even though we have no backlog, unlike you. <laughs> Already? Wow, fast. Uh, um, but um, if I could just deal with that. The commission has been criticized that it has such a large backlog. But how could you criticize when you have not given them the resources to clear a backlog? There is a difficulty when we do have cases which come to the court from the commission, which has been in the commission for 8, 10, 14 years, which has happened on, on occasion. And when part of that case is that the state has delayed in doing whatever it had to do to protect um, the citizen or, or repair the violations of their rights. But I submit that the Commission has been trying to do the best that it can in, in what it, it has um, been given. And that takes us back to the states because you must, we must not forget that it is a political process. The states are the OAS and it's politicians who decide what happens to the organs which have been created by this political body. So, do any of us feel that our states will and do engage in moves to protect the human rights of their citizens? Do we? Do we believe that they do? Do we, do we believe that they would do everything in their power to do so? Clearly not because states have failed. This is why the commission is so overladen with work. And it is getting more and more so. It is very unfortunate, as the only English-speaking judge of the court, I have felt um, quite on my own and embarrassed sometimes. Why have we, we not taken possession of the system? Why? Have we, are we suffering from the apathy mentioned earlier? So, we have the ignorance, not only of our people, we have the ignorance of our judges, we have the ignorance of our academics, we have the ignorance of our politicians, our representatives who, are put, who we put there to govern, to make laws, if they do not know about these processes and what their duties are, how can they engage? So what are we supposed to do, I ask? It has been mentioned that we should engage with government first. I think not. We have to now. We've been engaging with government for years and we haven't succeeded. We have to now engage with the people. So we come to the promotion aspect of the commission. That is vital if we're going to get the CARICOM countries to take possession as the Latin American countries have. They have full possession, complete and utter. And we have to exercise our right to that possession which we could have in the system, which we have failed to do. One, we have to tell our people how they can engage in it, what benefits they can get from it. And the commission cannot do so only by on-site visits. I beg to differ. We know our people are visual people. They are musical. They love dance, they love pictures. That, we should use that system to engage them and teach them about the system so that then they can force the political directorate to do what it should to get into the system. So, query. What should the commission do about its backlog? How are you going to clear it? I suggest perhaps you should consider and stakeholders should consider, can the commission decide that any matter which has been with it for longer than say three, four, five years 
be directed to a friendly settlement arrangement? Or should it be directed to an alternative dispute resolution system? Should you change your regulations, your rules, in order to enable it to do that? Because then in some way you have to clear that system. And it is important for the Commission to continue. Because unlike the European system, which did away with their commission, look at the situation the court has found itself in. We have a system wherein the commission itself monitors all its recommendations that it makes to the state. We have a system where the court itself monitors its, the uh, implementation of its judgments. So there is control in these systems, which does not uh, um, exist in Europe anymore. We have a much, in my opinion, humble opinion, a much stronger system in which our bodies engage to see that what they recommend for the protection and reparation of human rights are, are followed by the state parties to, to, to the convention. We have a plethora of, of instruments in this region, in the Americas, and we still don't engage. We have the Protocol of San Salvador, which deals with economic and social and, uh, um, rights. Uh, um, and only 14 countries, I believe, have ratified it. Four have signed, have signed it. Um, we have, that's five now, right? We have, we have, oh, we have to get to the <laughs> stage, we have to get to the stage where our um, um, membership in these bodies represent all the language speaking areas of the Caribbean. If we do not have that, can we truly say it's in the original? When it is Latin American 50, English speaking one, French none, Dutch, none, you know, and so on. So we, we, I think it rests with us. And we must introduce our common law principles into these organs. They have lost a lot because we have not been able to effectively do so. I have tried in my own little self. And I'm called in our system judge by my colleagues. And I say I am proud of it because our system is rich. We can expand our principles. We need not apply, apply the word for word of treaties, but we can use the principles to expand our interpretation of our laws and our legal system. And I enjoin you, all of you who are here today, please, you must work so that we get into that system and take possession of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we have had a very rich discussion and uh, we are now going to have about um, 15 minutes or so for um, uh, interactive discussion. But before I throw the floor it open to you, I'd like to invite Professor Shelton to just make a few remarks. Thank you very much. I'll try to be very, very quick in responding to some of the comments and proposals that were made by, by the various commentators here. Uh, first, a reporting system. States in their great wisdom decided not to create one for the inter-American system. It would kill us. The African is the only regional system that has re self-reporting and it does not work at all. There's no reason to duplicate what the UN is doing and in fact some governments have said to me the reason we don't ratify is we can't take on an additional reporting burden, and I said, well, you don't have one in the inter-American system. Secondly, on the economic, social, and cultural rights, we hear this from governments about why don't we give equal treatment to the two sets of rights. States chose not to put economic, social, and cultural rights in the convention. And then they chose to write a protocol that did not give us jurisdiction on the justiciability of any of the protocol with the exception of three rights. Uh, democracy and human rights, the same thing. 
states, member states chose to give election monitoring to another body. They chose not to give us any jurisdiction over the Inter-American Democratic Charter. Uh, so some of the things that we are circumscribed by what the states tell us we can and can't do. Uh, on reporting, the Jamaica report has been approved. It will be published very soon. It's probably in print at the current moment. Uh, so you will see a new report on a CARICOM country. Staffing problem. We brought the entire CARICOM representation from the legal staff of the commission. I don't know where he went, but that's it, one. Okay. We need applicants from the region to come and join the staff. Desperately need. So all of you law instructors, we have an internship program. Whenever there's an opening, have people apply. We need to expand um, the staffing from this region. One of the proposals we have accepted, we have already um, voted on, is to make the president of the commission a full-time person. So we are working now with the Secretary General on the financing of this so that we can have a full-time president. Um, another area in which we are subject to state will is uh, on-site visits. I have three pending requests with governments that keep delaying, saying it's not convenient, don't come now. Don't, you know. So we can't go without the consent of the government. Um, a final point on ratifications, there's been some really good work, empirical work done recently on treaty systems that have concluded that the more states ratify, the more states ratify. So it takes a certain breakthrough of a log jam and the leadership of a couple of countries to make it then harder for other countries to hold out. And it really is important, and, and I'll just conclude by taking off my commission hat and just speaking about how important this system has been for improving human rights in the United States. Um, and it's, again, this harder it, the, the harder it is to be a holdout as more countries step up their human rights performance. The U.S. was one of four countries in the world still executing those under the age of 18. And the Supreme Court paid attention to international opinion in outlawing that constitutionally. It cited to international jurisprudence and international agreements. So that has an impact, and it's necessary to continue the kind of pressure that Judge McCauley was talking about to build that culture of human rights throughout the system. Thank you very much. Now we have our first question. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, good afternoon, everyone. Yes. Um, my uh, question Please is to the... Please first identify yourself. And then my name is Westman James. I'm a lecturer at the Faculty of Law, Keyville Campus. Thank you. My question to the commission is, I think, or a comment would be the engagement of the young generation, the youth, in relation to the work of the commission, the court, and the inter-American system. While I do agree that one has to um, advertise and to bring awareness to the commission and so on, I think the generation that is being lost, the younger generation who will be feeding to, into the system later on, are not well, to, to me, engaged in the process of the commission. And I think, in a, in a sense, in strengthening the commission, I think that engagement needs to be done, um, needs to be done soon, and to get as many young people behind either their governments, their states, to get into the system and, and work on it for it to be successful. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, can I say, can I say yes. something? Um, uh, if I could just, if I could just um, um, say this, that um, Mr. Robinson mentioned earlier that um, NGOs should, uh, civil society should be encouraged to be more uh, participatory. I turn it around and say that civil society in the region is also acting like our states are acting, mm -hmm. because civil society in Latin America are fully engaged. They're fully engaged in the system. Mm -hmm. So it's up to you. Up to you. <laughs> yes, Dr. 
the school day. Thank you. I'm going to take off the low hat and put on the governance hat for a moment. And um, one, of the, uh, one of the things that I'm hearing, one of the challenges that we're facing in the region is more a governance challenge than one particularly related to human rights. And it's the ability to transfer what we think is the right thing to be done to practice. And that's not something that in today's world that, depend, that depends on states. And uh, well, the, the academics would say you'd need to have a constructivist approach to it and realize that norms and values are really transformed through the lives of those uh, practicing, espousing those norms, which then get transformed and re-proclaimed um, as a result of the exchange of beliefs. Um, I think that in the region, perhaps we're missing that step. And uh, that's where I would say I'd put on my governance hat because more and more, it's not just the democratically elected leaders that have to have that process, but precisely the people down in Sandy Grande. And that's where perhaps we're still not reaching in the Caribbean. And it's difficult to reach because uh, those persons aren't engaged. Uh, it's, uh, it's uh, I don't know, chicken and egg situation, but how to engage them successfully. You know? And we can't depend on the states to do that. But yet, agencies often don't have the resources to do that. But we need to develop perhaps using the technology, which has successfully helped many states to engage and ratify the international level because of the pressure from their local communities. So maybe we could be looking more at how to engage the wider, wider cross-section of society who perhaps aren't necessarily involved in the system. Uh, hello again, uh, Sheldon A. Mitchell, uh, you all know me, kind of. Hopping off of what was just said, it's always a question of resources, yes? And there's never enough resources to send enough people out into the fields to do the work. There's so much work to do and so few hands. But what is required really is I have, I have hope for the country and hope for the region because there are people like us who exist and we're here. But oftentimes we're motivated by things other than making society better. Sometimes we're motivated by money and how much we can get. So we, we, we might have to make secondary those, those things that say, like, I need to have a, a Mercedes Benz this year or something. I, I think everybody who's here, they're here for the right reasons. Uh, we need to engage the younger people who are in high school and, and in university so that they come out trying to make society better and so they take some of their time to give to, you know, um, people who, are, who might be the people in Granite that I sometimes go and see, but people that you ordinarily meet in the street. It's up to us, according to um, the good judge, and it really is up to us. We can't wait for the government to do it because we'll all be dead. So thank you very much. Thank you. One in the back, please. The green room. Huh? At the back. <laughs> sure. Hi, good afternoon. I am, my name is Elaine Thompson sometimes. I'm a chartered accountant. So I am, among attorneys, I am an accountant. I was invited here by chance. And I would like to say that in, in some senses you're preaching to the choir. It seems it's a community that knows each other well, intimately. I belong to Institute of Chartered Accountants in Trinidad and Tobago, as, as well as ACCA. We are not invited to things like this. Um, people talk about resources and so on. I used to be a teacher in Bishop Patsy High School, which is in high school. There are ways you can engage the rest of the community, whether it is you go to, to, six form, uh, oh, to six formers or whoever it is. And until we get outside of our comfort zone where we are talking to the attorneys and the NGOs, we will not go further. That's all. Um, I think I'm going to have to um, start um, concluding this very, very interesting session. 
and I must first ask our panelists uh, in the order in which they started off to make a short closing comment. Mr. Geezer? Yes. <laughs> I got away from Geezer and Geyser. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Chairman. <laughs> well, my, my closing remark is directly related to the last comment. Start in preschool. Talk to the children because, as someone mentioned, it is in the next generation and in the generation after that you'll be building the society in this region. Thank you. Now, now is the time. Um, very quickly, within one minute, two points. One is I would like to thank the Inter-American Human Rights Commission for inviting me here as a kind of a foreigner to the debate, but maybe be pre pre precisely because I'm a foreigner, I wanted to make one concluding remark, and that is I feel this was an excellent seminar, well conducted, well designed, um, well attended, I would even say, but I think it's not good enough. What I was missing here really was representatives of the major stakeholder governments. Why nobody from foreign affairs was here? Nobody from the um, Ministry of Planning? Nobody from the, well, the Attorney General, we had a speaker. But very, very few people. And that I find is simply, we are, we are talking about converted here. What is needed is now a very deliberate, concerted effort to promote this system, which, as we all said, is not well known and needs to be promoted. Promoted with governments in the first instance, but also with other target groups, including, including the law, law faculties. I always criticize that in UV, St. Augustine, in the law school, there is not a single lecture given on international human rights. You know, certainly not up to now. Maybe it's changing now that we have a new dean. But this is a shame, and you ha Yeah, but he, he's, he's teaching it where? In Barbados? Starting now. So, yeah, starting. Exactly. So that... Um, you know, you have generations of young lawyers in Trinidad who have never really been exposed to the human rights system. Um, those few specialists, human rights specialists, here in Trinidad and Tobago, they all have been trained abroad, in England in particular. Not again, no, I would agree, but it has been. It has been for a long time. Okay, I ca rest my case. Thank you. <laughs> Can I borrow this? I won't want to stand up this time. Um, if, I, if I could just make a couple of um, 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 statements. Um, I think my basic premise remains. I think it rests with the peoples of the Caribbean. It's not on? Oh. I, I should swallow it? <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Uh, I think it rests with the peoples of the Caribbean because when the politicians feel constrained that the people want them to do certain things, they will have to do it. And I, I, if I give an example, the court had a special session in Barbados in which we dealt with a case dealing with adoption of a child unknown to the father of the child at the time. The child was in effect, in fact, sold by the mother yeah, to a rich couple. And even judges of the High Court in Barbados said they never knew that such a subject could be a human rights issue to be decided in a human rights court. And so lots of people think about human rights on the basis of the traditional old views. It, it cuts across everything we do every day in our lives, and if we get people to understand that, 
they will engage and they will make their governments engage. Because I remember when we used to go around, I think Hillel knew when my husband, Burson and I used to go around talking about the Constitution of Jamaica. People used to say the Constitution is for lawyers. But when we, he, he came up with this, the, the phrase, the Constitution affects the price you pay for bread. They started understanding the importance of them knowing and using the Constitution. This is what we have to do here. And we should get in Jamaica to engage. Please, you have to help me with that. <laughs> I just um, wanted to thank um, Judge McCauley for her challenge. I mean, the reality is that we live in barely post-colonial cultures, and we obviously we need to take leadership, but we're leading, taking leadership from a space that we need to transform. And certainly the people who spoke up about wanting to do uh, more work um, at human rights education and mobilization, please talk to me, and let's figure out what we can do together. Um, domestically, I wanted to throw one additional challenge out um, uh, to the, well, somewhat to the commission, but one of the things we're struggling to do is create more space within the OAS system for Caribbean civil society participation, which faces considerable challenges because there simply aren't language services. Um, and that's a, certainly a structural issue that we could use your partnership in addressing. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's, I now have to close our session. I, I deprive myself of the pleasure of making a closing remark, and I hand the matter over to Professor Robinson, who will do that on our behalf. Thank you, Sir Dennis. Can I make one quick suggestion? <laughs> I know I'm talking too much, but this is really not mine. <laughs> suggestion it came in fact from you and from a number of other people namely that this audience here we should observe one minute of silence right now before we go to the concluding remarks to commemorate I wouldn't say celebrate but commemorate the International Day of Peace which is today declared by the UN Secretary General so please let us observe one minute before we go on. Thank you. In wrapping up today's session, first to thank you, Sir Dennis, for ch <laughs> to thank you, Sir Dennis, for chairing um, this very important panel for us, and to all the the panelists, um, to the moderators, to the commissioners who helped to guide the discussion. Of course, I want to say a word of special thanks to the Institute and for the, the wonderful support and assistance, both of the interim director um, and particularly of uh, Mrs. Marilyn Ramon Fortune, who I don't know if she's in the room at the moment, uh, but to say a special word of thanks to her and all of the staff, and similarly, to the staff of the Inter-American Commission, and particularly to, to um, human rights specialist Hilaire Sobers, <laughs> for whom this kind of effort is a special labor, as um, Commissioner Shelton mentioned, the sole Caribbean staff member on the Commission um, Secretariat. I wanted to just offer in a minute or two some of the themes which have um, have emerged from the discussions. Uh, what do we know or what don't we know? Uh, I think we're struck by the importance of the universal jurisdiction which the Commission has in respect of all CARICOM states. 
But we did point to, and I think particularly Douglas Mendez, to the value of also being a party to the main instruments of the system. Um, someone described the, the, the system as, I think, Commissioner Shelton, as a regional safety net. Um, and Dr. Bulkan mentioned why this is so valuable for Caribbean states and particularly English-speaking states. But I think we accepted how little known the system is. Um, the words used to describe were apathy, hostility, ignorance. Uh, but that this system had a lot to offer the Caribbean. And the Caribbean equally, I think both Justice Macaulay and Commissioner Shelton pointed to how much the, 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 the Caribbean can also offer the system. In terms of the challenges, we heard generally about the challenge of building a culture of human rights, in particularly engaging all, including youth, in that exercise. The need for the Commission to increase its presence in the Caribbean, and I think that is also understood and acknowledged, and the importance of strengthening the monitoring of human rights in the Caribbean, and the words which I think Colin Robinson used was that rights holders in small developing Caribbean countries also face very specific challenges which an international human rights system can also support. Um, I think towards the end we, we concluded that there was a need to take possession of this system in the Caribbean. Um, the words I used in the beginning that we should resist Caribbean exceptionalism and um, both Colin and Douglas spoke about the value of resisting exceptionalism and the, the benefits to us in the Caribbean uh, of fully engaging. The elephant in the room, the death penalty, uh, Douglas Mendez gave a number of reasons why that should not today continue to be an impediment to full engagement. In terms of next steps for those of you who are here, we're in a very distinct process at the moment. You can share your comments on the process on strengthening with the Commission uh, through its website. This proceedings have been webcast and will be available. You can share it with those who haven't had an opportunity to be here and also share your comments with us. Uh, we look forward in the future to seeing more users of the system. I think the taking possession is equally true, as Judge McCauley said, for civil society as it is for states. Um, please allow us, certainly for those of us who are from the region, to be conduits to you, to be a source of information, to help to strengthen the relationship between the Commission and the Caribbean. Thank you very much for spending the morning with us. And I can declare the proceedings over. <laughs>